morning, I'd like to call this meeting of the Board of Health, the Lane County Board of Health, to order. This is a July 18th meeting, regular meeting of the Board of Health. It will be followed by a regular meeting of the Board of County Commissioners. So initially, we'll have a Board of Health meeting. Uh, we'll be taking public comments during the Board of Health meeting and during the regular board meeting. So if, you're, if your comments are for the board, then, uh, then you could save those until the uh, regular comment period, which will be following the Board of Commissioners meeting. However, in order for you not to have to wait through the board, the board of Health meeting, should you not desire to do so, although it is scintillating and you should, um, that, then I will uh, accept public comment on for the regular board during the uh, during the board of health public com public comment period. Unless I have any objections from the board, I see none. Good morning, Mr. Mokrahyski. Good morning. Uh, we'll begin with adjustments to the agenda. Do you see any adjustments to the agenda necessary? No. Okay. Thank you. To the board. I see none. Then we will move along with public comments. And as I mentioned, we will take uh, public comments from general public comments as well as public comments to the Board of, board of Health. Um, and we have uh, seven, six people signed up. We do generally allow three minutes for testimony. If you hear, this, if you hear the alarm go off, that will be the conclusion of three minutes, at which point please uh, complete your thought or your sentence and uh, allow the next person to approach, approach the uh, microphone. When you step forward, please state your name and your address for the record. First up is uh, Paul Biondi, followed by Ray um, McCauley, and McCauley, please correct me when you get to the microphone. Thank you. Uh, Paul Biondi. Good morning. Good morning, gentlemen. Thank you so much for uh, the work you do for our city. And uh, we have a couple of musicians on the, uh, the board, and so it's always great to be able to talk about a topic that uh, I know you guys enjoy. Uh, my name is Paul. Biondi, address 1625 Henderson Avenue, space F3, Eugene, Oregon, 97403. Um, well, the city is known for its music, and the Pacific Northwest, is, Eugene is represented very well uh, in our music scene. And uh, you go from the Holt Center, putting on classic, uh, classical music as well as pop music, The Shed, uh, the Wow Hall and uh, all the venues, uh, the Cuthbert, so um, and also McDonald Theater. So we uh, ran into a situation where musicians were lacking in health care. Even with the President, Affor President Affordable Care Act, they still either weren't qualifying or they uh, had very little. So we started back in 2005 with the Musicians Emergency Medical Association. And we've become an umbrella since then to help keep musicians stable while they go through their health issues or their family or significant others and their children. And it's been working well. Um, so we do one big fundraiser each year. And uh, Lavelle Vineyards has been kind enough to let us have that venue so we can put on a concert. And uh, that's uh, on the 30th of July. And uh, so after the Eugene Parade, uh, have everybody head up there and uh, have a great party and also do a th great thing for the uh, local music community. And uh, we have a, a great Boston Overgroup, Boston Air, to start the event off. And then I have a bunch of friends that are showing up to play with me. And then Ty Curtis is a young guitarist. He's a gunslinger. He's like Robert Cray. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's, he's going to be the big breakout artist of uh, Oregon here for us. And so he, he committed to do this fundraiser. And he's taking a lot less money than he usually would because he believes in the cause, and we're all pretty proud of that. Um, I've handed out some things for you, and um, if you could pass the poster around, I'd appreciate it. We have a height budget, and uh, so every poster counts for us to be able to get them up. And if you have any questions, we're going to stick around. And uh, thank you so much. And gentlemen, again, the things you do for our city, I hope our city realizes just how amazing you guys are and how you keep us running and keep us floating. Thank you very much. And thank you, Paul, for your philanthropic work throughout the community for years and years and years. Uh, people love your music, love the way you uh, respond. So thank you very much. Thank you. Next is uh, uh, Roy McCauley, Ray McCauley, followed by Sue Cox. Hello, gentlemen, and uh, I want to Reiterate what Paul said. Thank you for all your public service and all the work you guys do to help this city a better, be a better place for everybody. Uh, my name is Ray McCauley. 
My address is 1740 West Broadway, Eugene 97402. Um, Mima personally helped me twice over the last 10 years. I broke an elbow in a bicycle accident and I was off work for three months. So I had no income at all for three months and Mima helped me with a $500 check which they don't send to the person who gets the money, they send it to my landlord. It went straight to my bills, which is the way it should be. And the second time, I ended up in, in uh, emergency in the hospital for a week with uh, blood clots in my lungs. And I was unable to work for about six months that time. And they wrote me two checks totaling $1,000 straight to my landlord, help pay my rent. They really helped out a lot. That doesn't sound like a lot of money, but when you have zero income for six months, it's a lifeline. And they do so much good work for so many people, and the money is just really tight. It's hard to raise enough money to help all the people who need help. And I'm sure it's the same in all health care. Um, the Affordable Care Act helped a lot of people, but it doesn't help everyone. And MEMA kind of picks up in the slack. So um, if we can get people to show up, and maybe if they can't show up, maybe send a donation into MEMA to help out. Every little bit helps, even if it's just 5 or $10. It makes a difference. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Now, before uh, Sue Cox comes up, I'd, I'd change a little bit of a change in the order. When you come up, could you, could you please state your name and your address for the record, also your musical instruments and your music of preference? <laughs> so, Sue Cox, uh, followed by Peter Kowalki. Oh. <clears throat> yeah, I did. Yes, my name is Sue Cox, and I am not a musician, believe it or not. The only instrument I play are the ears. I had a uh, Catholic nun that cured me from music for a long time, so, <laughs> so sadly. But what we're doing here, again, is, has been restated. Oh, excuse me, again, my name is, I have to give, I guess, my real name. My real name is Suzanne Cox. And I am a Lowell life, or a Lowellian. Uh, my address is uh, 113 South Alder, Lowell, Oregon, 97452. So you get to meet one of your constituents, sir. Thank you. And uh, like I've been with the uh, Musicians Emergency Medical for about five or six years now, trying to help them. Uh, you know, work through all of the issues that come along, uh, spe uh, specifically with getting these annual uh, fundraisers going. What I've seen is sadly uh, the healthcare situation, you know, for everybody, especially with this, the unemployed or self employed musicians in the area have been uh, you know, undercovered, is what they called. Without the Affordable Care Act, there'd be several of these gentlemen, uh, men and women, that would not have had coverage. There, I hate to say that we would have had, maybe lost some along the way. We have, unfortunately, we have lost some. And uh, Eagle Park Slim, for example, and then we've got some others that are in the industry, you know, that we've lost over the last several years. Uh, one of the things that, mu that we've found with uh, the Musicians Emergency Medical or Lane County itself is that, uh, oh, I believe it was the uh, census that was taken several years ago, indicated that Lane County had 2% of its population saying that they were in the entertainment industry, believe it or not. But you think of it, uh, we've got the ballet, we've got the symphony, we've got the concert choir, we've got the university, we've got the Bach Festival coming in, seeing what kind of music that we have, plus our local weekly musicians that we have, Paul, Pete Geary, Pete Kowalki, Ray McCauley, you know, and we've been, that they're keeping a lot of our little, uh, you know, bars and restaurants open, you know, weekly. And it's, a, you know, con contribution to our economy. Plus, it's something that we can all also grow on. We've got, I have always used the term that Lane County has better musicians than it deserves. I mean, we get all of these transplants from LA We've got some fantastic music, I mean, all over. And it's one of these situations where what I've found working with them is we get, uh, with what money we do, you know, collect throughout the year, uh, we get probably about a half a dozen or so musicians that are destitute. 
I mean, Mr. McCauley ex explained his situation, but we've had everything from uh, people that have fallen, you know, some of them try to have a second job, uh, uh, you know, construction or whatever will break something and uh, unfortunately then have no source of income whatsoever. So when we come on to July 30th, remember that the Musicians Emergency Medical is an umbrella organization for all of the music, all of the entertainment, everything that you do in your life for entertainment. Thank you, Ms. Thank Collins. you. Next is Peter Kowalki, followed by Scott Cole. By the way, I uh, didn't, didn't transplant. I escaped. A long time. <laughs> <laughs> Morning, fellas. <clears throat> uh, Pete Kowalki, 405 West 23rd Avenue, Eugene 97405. These folks have said it very succinctly, very well. I don't really have a lot to say around town. I'm known as Peter Geary, <clears throat> but I'm giving my real name here for because I should. Anyway, uh, the museum, I think that's a great organization, and I know there are people in other uh, vocations that also are probably in the same situation. Maybe, you know, maybe they can take heart from something like this and, and begin to help because we all got to help each other especially through these times with things going on like this. And I know that there's been many people helped by MEMA. Uh, I haven't had to call on them yet. That's word. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I'm sure hundreds, actually hundreds of people have been in dire times. Uh, anyway, I'm just, I'm just another guy up here saying the same stuff because it's a good thing and it's going to be fun. There's going to be a lot of great people at this um, concert. Oh, by the way, I play guitar. <clears throat> and I play some piano and a few other things, and I write songs and stuff like that. So we've got to keep that, uh, keep that in keeping with uh, proper uh, adequate here. So uh, I had to throw a few big words. <laughs> yeah, so um, it's, it's a good thing, and it's going to be a great party. Um, so um, it'll be a great concert, and I don't know what we're asking of you except just to let you know that it's happening and uh, bring MEMA to the forefront a bit um, because it is a good thing, and maybe it can be copied by people in other vocations that don't have, uh, you know, the contract workers or what have you. Um, anyway, thank you. Uh, I appreciate it, and maybe we'll see some of you guys out there. And thanks for doing what you do, and it's always good to see you at the concert, too. Thank you, Pete Gary. All right. Thank you. Next is Scott Coe, followed by Cindy Kokas. Hey, good morning, and thank you for uh, the opportunity to address the commission today. I'm on a different topic. I'm here about what we call vegetation management. I think you're calling it roadside uh, assistance or roadside vegetation control. Uh, Scott Coe, general manager at Emerald PUD, and we have a lot of the rural area outside of town. And uh, our address is 33733 CV Loop Road in Eugene 97405. And I uh, just wanted to commend uh, the commission and actually the staff for the hard work they've done on this topic. We struggle with this mightily ourselves. Vegetation management is quite a, quite a bit of our budget, and uh, we, we really struggle with the balance of vegetation management and what we can do that's environmentally benign or you know, less intrusive. It is a balance, and uh, we really appreciate the time that uh, the, the county staff has put into coming up with some uh, ways of getting that balance in check and making it cost effective for the citizens of the county. Uh, we have been following it. We have met with your staff. They're very impressive people. They've done an excellent job of community outreach. And we have presented this to our board of directors several times. And last week they voted 5-0 to adopt whatever the county practices are uh, for Emerald PUD. And uh, so we just came here to say thank you for the time and effort you've put into this topic. Uh, we kind of feel like we're free riding on it, uh, so we certainly appreciate uh, what you've done uh, that we can tag along with. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Cole. Next is uh, Cindy Kokas, and Cindy Kokas is the last person we have signed up this morning. Hello again. Uh, Cindy Kokas, 65 West 30th Avenue. 
And I speak for Church, Lane County Church Women United, a Christian women's group. We endorse the idea of rest stop on Lane County land, and we want these in place by fall of 2017. Winter will come. We see these kind of actions as emergency actions to help our unhoused citizens. And when you have an emergency, charitable responses will follow. I was there in 1989 when we created the Interfaith Emergency Shelter System. And the story was, faith groups open your churches, get these families out of their cars, we're working on affordable housing. 28 years later, we're sheltering families, some of them, and we don't have this promise even being worked on as far as Church Women United can determine. We don't see the city, the county, the state, or the federal bringing affordable housing to people of lower incomes. There's a letter in the Register Guard today, and I'm quoting that. People of faith are a major force in providing care for homeless and poor. Providing, no. Speaking out and trying to get some system change, yes. Red for the World was formed here in Eugene, but they realized if we want to feed people, we have to have federal legislation action. And they produced a nice little item pictorially displaying of 24 food items, one is prepared by charitable organizations. The other 23 are due to the federal laws about feeding people. So I think we really need to be honest. Love one another, yes. Do something, yes. And we have people here who were elected to work for the people of their community. That's why you ask me where I live. Living in your community are people like the people in my immediate family. Some of them on the minimum wage. Anytime they want to do anything, that I put out a loan for a few thousand dollars because first month, last month, they don't have it. Not everybody has grandma. You are grandma. You have to realize you're needed. You need to do something. Emergencies responses are not honoring people and they're not loving. Thank you. Um, I understand we have one more person signed up. Uh, would that person step forward? Um, Wayne Martin, is that you? Yes. Okay, <laughs> step forward and state your name and address for the record, please. I don't even have my glasses on. <laughs> uh, good morning. Good to have the opportunity to speak briefly. My name is Wayne Martin. I live in the uh, Harlow district, um, but I've made an offer on a house on this side of the river, I think my favorite side, and uh, look forward to moving in August. I want to recognize uh, the affection that I have for Paul Biondi and other musicians, and uh, particularly Kenny Reed, your dear friend, who is still waiting for a kidney transplant and is uh, on severe dialysis. Um, they ha you have a special place in my heart. Uh, I served for a couple of years on the board of the Lamet Jazz Society and just adore the contributions you make and the way you play your horn. That's off the record, I guess. Back in January, you recall that there was a fairly well-publicized death of a homeless woman named Carrie Miller. The, our register guard was very generous in providing good coverage of that, and I did the funeral to a fairly large crowd at the Central Presbyterian Church. Um, a few days after that, I realized there were a lot of homeless individuals that did come to that service um, that needed to have a little bit more effective contact with each other, a little bit more of a sense of being part of a family and being able to do things when the, the, 
the time arose for them to do things. So I began calling meetings of some unhoused people just to talk things over. Um, we met in February and March, and in April, uh, I joined up with uh, another convener by the name of Angus McGuire, who lives here locally, and he's quietly acquiring a national reputation for his excellence in training people in how to be more organized and even more effective in what their goals are. Um, he's a real asset to our community and pretty well under the radar. We continue to dialogue every couple of weeks with unhoused people. We have a vision of unifying the unhoused to be more involved in the community and that in a positive way. It will not be an in-your-face approach that we're looking at taking, but an in-your-heart approach. This Sunday from 3 to 6 in the Free Speech Plaza, we're having a swap meet. It's midsummer, and unhoused people need to um, look through their backpacks, and I'll be done in a moment, and, f and see what they no longer need and what they do need, and that will be an opportunity for them to buy, sell, and acquire, and share things for the rest of the summer. I'm about trying to organize a kind of Gandhi-like approach to uh, getting people to attend meetings, express themselves without anger, and, and uh, I'm going to give you my card. If you want to make some decisions of any sort and would like um, some assistance uh, from people who are unhoused, let me, let me know and I'll bring it. Thank you, Mr. Martin. You can leave the cards with uh, Devin at the, at the back. Thank you. you do. Thanks for your time. Thank you for your testimony today and thank you everyone for your testimony today. Is there anyone in the audience this morning who wishes to address the Board of Health or the Board of County Commissioners? Seeing no one, we'll move along to uh, Commissioner's response. Normally we would ask for uh, other issues and remonstrances. I'll hold that until the regular public comment session. Uh, so Commissioner's response to the, the testimony this morning. Do I see any response? Commissioner Sorensen. Uh, I'm, I'm a lawyer, so I'll just say I'm an alleged trumpet player. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> For the resp response, Commissioner Lycan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I'm still a drummer, and uh, <laughs> so I still play. <laughs> um, <clears throat> years ago, I used to be actually a percussionist, but I'm not anymore. I'm just a drummer now. So it's just it's changed dr dramatically. Listen, I, I just want to say thank you very much, and to all of you who came in and, and testified this morning. Uh, uh, regarding MEMA, and I would agree, it's it's really beneficial. And and um, my uncle David started a company back in 1972 called Double T Promotions in Portland, Oregon. And um, I got to tell you, I've over the years, it's amazing on how many talented musicians you run into that don't get the big record deal. And in fact, most of those musicians you run into are much more talented than those who get the big record deal. And uh, so I think it's interesting. I wouldn't be surprised at all if that's the percentage of folks in Lane County that are in the, somewhere in the entertainment. I wouldn't at all. But I just want to say thank you for the really great work that you do. Uh, Ms. Kokas, would you stay, please? Sorry. I'm, a, I'm a real big supporter, and I really appreciate that very much. And, uh, and to Paul, I, uh, you know, you and I have been friends for years, and uh, I just uh, – I just respect you so much. It's too bad Pete, Pete left because uh, I just caught him not too long ago at a, at a winery playing, and, and uh, he's, again, one of those great, talented musicians that don't get the big record deal. And um, so, but I, I just want to say thank you very much for, for, for everything you do and for all of you that are active and involved and just for the music and entertainment value that you present to, to all of us here. It's, it's just a gift, and uh, I can't thank you enough. And from a musical taste, well, yesterday I was listening to Frank Sinatra, and this morning it was Tesla and Heaven's Tale. So you need trails, so you never know uh, what, what's going to happen with me. So anyway, thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner Lycan. And uh, you can see the picture of Commissioner Lycan at the drums in his office anytime you come up. So. Um, further uh, response? Uh, just a couple of things from me very quickly. Um, uh, first to Mr. Biondi and the group who spoke for uh, MEMA. Wow, uh, thanks. I'll, we, if we're not going to be there, Debbie and I will certainly uh, send our regards and, uh, and along with it a, 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 some support for your organization. So thank you. 
Um, and Ms. Kokas, I wanted to mention that uh, quite often people view uh, our response to homelessness in this community, and they don't often often don't see the entire picture of what is fully happening throughout the community. And and Lane County, the city of Eugene, city of Springfield, and the smaller uh, the outlying cities are really quite responsive in regard to response to homelessness, response to poverty. Uh, during my years as executive director of Food for Lane County, for instance, we distribute about seven million pounds of food a year to people who otherwise may not have, uh, have food. But uh, the one thing I wanted to mention is if you follow me from this meeting late this afternoon to uh, room 530 in, the Char in our Charnelton Health and Human Services building, you'll find me in what we call our winter strategies meeting. Now, it's more than just winter strategies, but we do discuss specifically what we do during the winter regarding people who otherwise are homeless. I'll be meeting this afternoon with uh, uh, Charlie Harvey, Dan Bryant, Dana Gray from the Mission, uh, Diana Wise from, uh, uh, let's see, from St. Vincent, uh, Aaron Fifield from Springfield, Keith Heath from, uh, from St. Vincent de Paul, Cari uh, Mia Cariaga from the city of Eugene, Paul Neville from St. Vincent de Paul, Lynn Oliver from county staff, Roxanne O'Brien from uh, St. Vincent, Scott, uh, Robin Scott from the county, Tom Mulhern from Catholic Community Services, uh, Regan Watgers from the city, uh, William Wise from St. Vincent, and Wolf, Pearl Wolf from the city, among others. We'll be discussing how we can best pool our resources and encourage other people to join us in effectively approaching uh, not just the winter, but how do we take care of folks who otherwise would be on the street, uh, who uh, certainly would wish to be in, uh, in more comfortable and uh, more um, uh, in an environment that is more uh, uh, more attuned to survival, shall we say? So that starts at 3:30 this afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, so any further response? Then we'll move move along to our uh, board of board meeting, the health board of health meeting. Um, any emergency business, Mr. Mokar Heisky? No. I see none. Then before us today, we have order number 1707-1801 in the matter of adoption of a permitted products list for use of herbicides by the Department of Public Works for Roadside Vegetation Management. Ms. mokar can you introduce the panel today? Yes, Mr. Chair, and I'm going to turn it over to Karen Gaffney here, who's going to make some introductory comments, and then she'll turn it over to Orrin. <laughs> uh, good morning, Commissioners, and I will be very brief. Um, you're convened today as the Board of Health, um, but this item is a public works item, and, and actually I want to appreciate the staff at Public Works for the wonderful collaboration um, that really we've brought the public health perspective on this and the public works uh, need together. And as I know, Oren will walk you through the process, but you are convened today as the Board of Health in the role you have in Lane Code to review a proposed product list um, for roadside spraying. So I will uh, let the staff at Public Works take it from here. Thanks, uh, Karen and Chair Farr and Commissioners. Um, I'm Orange Schumacher, Road Maintenance Manager with Lane County Public Works. Um, air guitar was as close as I ever got. <laughs> so I'm sad to say that's why I'm here. My musical talents did not uh, flourish. Um, I want to introduce Pam Reber. She's the Natural Resource Specialist with Lane County Public Works, and she's going to be the primary presenter today on this topic. Um, I did want to give a brief history. I know Commissioner Williams wasn't on the board um, over the last 12 years that um, Commissioner, staff, and myself have been engaged in uh, roadside vegetation management at Lane County. It started well before I got there, but uh, as many people are aware, in 2005, um, Ordinance um, 1203, or otherwise known as the Last Resort Policy, was implemented at Lane County, which um, put some severe restrictions on the use of herbicides for any roadside veg control activities. Since that time, we've been working with the community, interest groups, um, uh, a, a county administrator appointed task force, uh, what used to be known as the Vegetation Management Advisory Committee, to try to find a, a program that was um, at best trying to satisfy all those involved from environmental protections, waterway protections, um, all the way to what we needed to ensure we were cost effectively using our dollars to manage what we had out there. Um, in 12 years, we've learned a lot. Um, I never thought this road would be um, as windy as it was to get where we are today, but um, I'm hopeful that by the end of today, if we get commissioner support, that we can begin implementing something that has taken a long time to get to this point and, and further adapt it as we move forward. Um, I do want to acknowledge a couple of people in the audience. Um, James Ma and Biddy Roy uh, are in the back row. They served on the Vegetation Task Force. 
Um, as commissioners may know, that was a nine-member task force that was appointed by the county administrator um, that was represented by uh, medical professionals, um, botanists, uh, environmentalists, um, farm bureaus, and others to really find this rounded approach, which is what the ordinance in front of you today is. Uh, the board has already acted on the task force recommendations. This is the final phase uh, before we begin implementation. Um, I also want to thank Scott for showing up and representing the utilities. Um, we do plan to develop partnerships over the coming years to ensure we use the money as wisely as we can and partner to develop those relationships to ensure that happens. Uh, with that said, I'm also very happy to pass the torch today uh, to Pam, who will be inheriting a lot of this work moving forward. So with that said, uh, Pam. Thank you, Oren, and good morning, commissioners. Good morning, Pam. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, let's see. Well, as Oren mentioned, my name is Pam Reber, and I'm the road maintenance natural resource specialist tasked with implementing the, task, the vegetation task force recommendations brought into Lane Code Chapter 15 by Ordinance 1607. I thought I would begin by reading the purpose section of Ordinance 1607, as it clearly states the intent and practice of Lane County Public Works Road Maintenance Division in regards to your board action today. Section 15500, number one, Lane County promotes roadside vegetation management practices that emphasize environmental protection, promote health and safety of the public and county employees in order to support vibrant communities and preserve infrastructure. Lane County shall serve as a positive model for environmental stewardship. Number two, the county shall use non-herbicidal control methods, including prevention, as its preferred tools for roadside vegetation management. Permitted herbicides may be used when other methods or options have been ineffective. Staff and Vegetation Task Force members work together to develop the recommendations and ordinance that guides our integrated vegetation management program. This is an approach to roadside vegetation management that uses the right tool for the job. In many areas, mowing does a good job of controlling vegetation if we have proper staffing and equipment. Partnership, strategy, and education are all tools as well. Today, our focus is on a short list of herbicides that are necessary for a few scenarios in which Lane County Road Maintenance currently has no other adequate methods. But to be clear, we will not launch a spray program with approval today, but rather a data-driven approach that prioritizes roadside vegetation work, specifically guardrails, high-priority noxious weeds, stump sprouting trees and shrubs, and safety issues such as visibility on our roadsides. The County Road Maintenance Division began its ordinance work with an invasive plant inventory on 1,100 miles of roads, as well as a survey of the vegetation level of 1,200 of our 1,600 guardrails, which will continue on a three-year schedule. This effort also involved the development of a data-driven system based on our division's pioneering use of ArcGIS Online, specifically the collector application, which you see screenshots here, as well as the device that we use to collect data. Here's a map of Lane County showing 145 high-priority noxious weed detections, and this would be a representation of 11 of our high-priority noxious weeds. So these are species we just have one or two infestations of, and if we control them now, um, we will not see extensive use of herbicide in other places to control them in the future. Our next step of implementation of Ordinance 1607 has been the preparation of a proposed permitted products list. Staff conducted rigorous review of the ordinance and road maintenance needs in order to develop a pilot strategy based on the invasive plant and guardrail inventory. We then identified six products that would be most effective and lowest risk. Extensive research was conducted from a diversity of sources ensuring that the proposed permitted products matched the criteria set out in Lane Code. Detailed review by the Public Health Advisory Committee resulted in a rec recommendation of the list you are considering of approval, approval of today. And you'll see there are just three products on the list at this point. 
Aminopyrrolid was selected based on its effectiveness on meadow knapweed. Here are some photos of roads with various levels of knapweed infestation. On the right, you'll see Horton Road um, has about our worst um, meadow knapweed infestations in the county. Uh, we rated it as solid. We would like to prevent that condition from um, continuing. Amazapir was selected based on its effectiveness on new invasives present in small populations that pose a big threat to like puncturevine and knotweed. Here's a location on um, Rao River Road where we made an unsuccessful attempt at excavation. Digging deeper would have damaged the roadbed and um, we went as far as we could to get the knotweed out, um, but it was insufficient. So herbicide would be the only control. Finally, triclopyr is our most important tool in the management of vegetation on guardrails, as well as with noxious weeds like gorse. And gorse is reaching crisis level proportions down in Southern Oregon, and we would like to prevent um, the fire danger and other risks that it poses here in Lane County. So our next steps uh, with approval of the Proposed permitted product list would include implementing a pilot program in 2017 that focuses on our priority guardrails, preventing the establishment of new invasive species, and cons conservation and agricultural land protection. We would also secure applicator licensing for key staff and vegetation crew members, as well as continuing our relationship with the Public Health Advisory Committee. And with that, I'd like to uh, thank our volunteer members of the Public Health Advisory Committee for their sincere and rigorous review, their commitment to protecting public health and working with public work staff to develop a list that adequately reflects the intent of the community cannot be understated. We also could not have had such a high quality review process without the support of Health and Human Services. I'd like to thank Diana Avery and Karen Gaffney for all of their professional facilitation and cooperation with our department. Thank you, commissioners. And I, um, I get to do a little bit of wrap up before we turn it back over to you. And uh, again, as I started, I want to thank again the Public Works staff. Uh, I think everyone in this process took their role very seriously. Uh, as you began the launch of this program, you asked Public Works to, to really look in the, the, the field, as it were, um, to determine what are the best products to solve the problems that we have. And you asked our Public Health staff and Advisory Committee to do a thorough review and um, provide comments back to you so that as a Board of Health, you could make that final decision on permitted products. Um, so I want to assure you from a public health perspective, um, as Pam said, the, the committee was quite engaged. Um, she met with the committee a number of times with large spreadsheets and impacts, and we all dusted off our chemistry background um, to look at these products and really did a weighing test too. We looked at the criteria that the board established in code in terms of those permitted products um, and reviewed each of the proposed products against that and then really looked at human health impacts. And I would say yeah. here those human health impacts are not only uh, the chemical impacts from the products but also the impacts of doing nothing which is I think why, um, why the board brought us back here because there are serious health and safety um, issues of not addressing some of the key areas of vegetation that Public Works has identified. Um, so in that balance effort, I think it was last week, maybe the week before, we talked about bicyclists who are um, making their way on our roadways and um, addressing issues around guardrails. Um, so the, from a public health perspective, these three products um, make sense as a place to start, and um, so we support public health's um, proposal there. And I would also remind you this is an annual review process, so as a Board of Health you can expect um, there may be an opportunity um, next year to weigh in on um, any potential changes after the initial launch of the project. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Commissioner Parr. Thank you, Ms. Gaffney, and thank you for the hard work on this. A lot of, a lot of work went into this since uh, the 2008 moratorium. I think we started thinking about it around then, and uh, here we are nine years later. 
um, with a great deal of work. And the action that you're presenting today I'm reading is uh, the outcome of a process setting motion in order to assure the health considerations are being met by the Public Word Works Road Maintenance Division. So with that, I'll turn it over to questions and comments from the board. Commissioner Williams and Commissioner Likens, excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for their hard work on this. Um, a special shout out to Ms. Reber. Uh, one of the privileges I had as mayor in Cottage Grove was to work with folks to help establish the Coast Fork uh, of the Willamette watershed. And that was probably an effort uh, of a, about 15 years ago. But uh, Ms. Reber has uh, had a very, very strong presence in that organization, uh, shepherding along a lot of good projects. And so I just acknowledge that she has uh, vast experience in watershed issues in relation to uh, protecting riparian zones and waterways and those other uh, things that may have an impact here. She is a professional in, uh, in understanding uh, those issues surrounding uh, waterways and riparian zones. Thank you. So we should feel safe with the Orin turning over the reins. Excellent. <laughs> Commissioner Lykin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I, I really have, uh, I don't have any questions. Uh, I just want to say to staff and to our committee, thank you very much for the work that you've done. I'm seeing the two back there, a little blinded but from the window right there in that car. But uh, but I want to, but I do see you. And uh, But I want to say thank you very much. And your time and commitment. I mean, I, I uh, what I see here is we went from kind of a, an extreme approach to a very pragmatic approach. And I think it's uh, I think it's going to be very beneficial. This is one I I strongly support, and I want to just thank you for the great work involved. Um, uh, I and, and I think overall, when you look at the the, uh, the makeup of the advisory committee, it was a good diverse group, and brought all sorts of opinions in, into the into the mix. I think that's very important. I think that uh, gives I think that gives us uh, I know me as uh, as a commissioner a lot of confidence in in what's uh, before us. So great job, thank you very much, and I really appreciate the work here involved. Thank you, Commissioner Lykin. Commissioner Bozovich. <clears throat> thank you. Yeah, so I, I want to thank both the Public Health Advisory Committee and the uh, Vegetation Management Task Force. Um, that was it was a long process, and I remember the uh, the petitions that came in back in what was that 2012 that were asking for something to be done about invasive species uh, that came in mostly from the farm community that was uh, feeling threatened. You know, their livelihood was feeling threatened, and particularly some of the folks out. In the Horton Road area that you pointed out um, about our right of way actually causing uh, extreme economic stress to these hay farmers out there. Um, and in fact, what's kind of interesting is I got a call, um, I guess it was yesterday, uh, from uh, uh, Jesse Chapman uh, down in the North Fork, uh, and his family's owned a uh, farmstead there for generate multi generations, a pioneer farmstead. Uh, has a historic marker out front, concerned about what his, as he described it, his dad calls white top, and I'm not sure if that's the correct weed name or not. I know there's a hairy white top, um, but that's mostly in eastern Oregon. Um, but he thinks it's being brought in on our, our mowing equipment and was asking about are we washing our mowing equipment as we move from watershed to watershed or from area to area. And I, I thought maybe, give it, you know, having gotten that call yesterday and knowing this was coming up on the agenda, I thought I'd ask publicly about some of the things we're doing that are non-chemical to control the spread of invasive species. Um, if you guys could talk a little bit about things like equipment washing and 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 not mowing weeds that are spread by 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 mowing and and how we're you know trying to deal with that. Yeah, and I'll try to tackle that one. It's a complicated answer. We're aware of it. Um, the process to getting to where we can take seven tractors across 1,400 miles and adequately clean them and maintain them to prevent the spread of weeds is just going to be inefficient. Um, we've done uh, trials of washing. We've done trials of, of blowing off the, the flail mowers as we go. 
the issue is, is those seeds will find any crevice and crack on those tractors to get. So um, we have seen uh, a very likely trend of, of our grass tractors um, spreading weeds from one location to another. They do stay just somewhat geographically located into maintenance areas, but they do move around. Um, and we don't have uh, in our current practices the ability to manage those weeds in the transport. We've looked at the Forest Service and what they're doing with wash stations, but we're so remote getting out there with pressure washers and having the ability to do that um, at this time is just not feasible. Could I also follow up? Sure. So um, I'd love to follow up with you about this particular call and um, sort of as part of the strategy that um, I'm going to probably be writing up as the next step of my work in addition to implementing this um, is uh, would be our, our our pilot projects. And so, um, so just taking a so both looking at our, our maintenance work currently as how it happens, and then um, um, developing specific strategies that work um, well and efficiently. So for example, um, our safety strip mowing. So um, our, our objective is to make two passes um, each year around the county with our mowers, and that's a a heck of a lot of work. We have breakdowns. There's all sorts of things that happen. But if we make a safety strip mow, um, what I'm seeing in my preliminary um, uh, inspections is that we get good control of noxious weeds that are in you know maybe half of the roadside area and uh, with that first seed set and then we're also enhancing some of our native plants um, and but most importantly is we're reaching our, our safety goals and so um, that gives us a chance to still see the vegetation that's there um, but really what I want to get at is that, you know, we can make more targeted plans, um, but, you know, it kind of needs to be prioritized simply because our county is so large. And so um, that's why we're going to continue our noxious weed inventory. That's why we're going to um, be doing a data-driven process about what works on what species and then um, prioritizing uh, ideally from an infestation standpoint. So. Um, big infestations, you know, will we'll need a particular strategy, whereas smaller ones will be more of a, a rapid response strategy. And um, I'm happy to work with you in more detail so we can kind of meet um, the community's concerns um, around this because it is um, complicated. <laughs> Thank, you, yeah. Thank you, Commissioner Bolivich. Thanks. Uh, and I want to just say I think you guys have done a great job coming up with this list, and I look forward to some of the woody plant control as a cyclist and having ridden the Mackenzie View recently and having to ride almost in the center line of the lane to keep off the blackberries at the guardrails. Um, I'm looking forward to that control and I'm, and I'm sure that Scott and the utilities are looking forward to some of that control of some of those uh, trees that do the stump and, and root sprouting that are really tough for those guys to deal with. Commissioner Sorensen. Thank you. Um, on the in the materials uh, talks about the vegetation task force recommendations and then the public health advisory committee I'm a little more familiar with the public health advisory committee than the vegetation task force uh, Mr. Schumacher could you just review who are the current members of the task force so the task force has gone into hibernation. Um, it was a nine-member task force, and I will try to go through my recollection off the top of my head. So Ellen Mooney was chairing it. She was from the ag community. So was George Greer um, out of the Coburg area. Um, Biddy Roy, who's in attendance, uh, was with the University of Oregon. And an expert on the Red Queen hypothesis, I'd like to note. <laughs> um, For all you Red Queen hypothesis followers. Yes, there's many of True. them. True. Um, uh, James Mao, who is also in attendance here today, uh, was with the University of Oregon. I, I shall acknowledge that he's recently retired from the University of Oregon, and he's wearing a Hawaiian shirt, which symbolizes that. Um, so good for him. Congratulations. Um, we also had uh, Lisa Arkin from Oregon Toxics, and then um, Jim... Lakehomer represented um, kind of the medical community. He also served on the PHAC. And, um, no, we got George. There was another gentleman, James, who was with Willamalane representing um, Joel Miller. Thank you, uh, James, for getting that. Yes, I'm trying to get these off the top of my head. So they all represented that diversity of uh, feedback into the process. Okay. Thank you. Oh, and Will Lackey, by the way, with Oregon Department of Transportation. Thank you, Commissioner Sorensen. Then uh, just a couple of things. I saw the head of the list was French broom. Uh, having Scottish heritage, I'm glad that something's replaced my personal favorite. 
Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, <laughs> There's a Spanish broom, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad that his French is the worst. <laughs> um, and not Scottish. Um, so uh, just one thing I wanted to once again um, mention uh, to, to read, uh, in case anybody happens to be listening. You know, we're, we're, we're always concerned about health and the environment and how the things that we do affect the environment, not on a short-term basis, but on a longer-term basis. And uh, I'm reading the uh, 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 citation. These practices reflect the guidance and proposed recommendations of the Vegetation Management Task Force embodied in Ordinance 1607. And in order to continue to model accountability and respect our community's concern for the use of, her concern for the use of herbicides, our program is committed to transparency, community engagement, communication, and partnerships, policies which ensure that implementation of our pr proposed permitted product list is done with the most prudent and safe manner. That sums it up as far as I'm concerned. The work that you've done has uh, presented us with a healthy uh, alternative to, uh, to what is uh, an ineffective method of uh, trying, to, trying to control herbs and make our roads safe for travel. So thank you very much. Any further discussion or comments from the board? Then we have before us order 1707-1801. Do I have a motion? Commissioner Bozo. I'll move approval of order 1707-1801. H. Second. Moved by Commissioner Bozovich, seconded by Commissioner Lykin. Discussion to the motion? I see none. I'll call for the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Passes unanimously. Thank you for the work and thank you for bringing this before us this morning. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you. Enjoy the sunshine. Mr. Mocker High School, we now have employee recognition. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'll invite Alicia Hayes up here to join me. We typically do uh, we recognize, as the board knows, uh, individual contributions and team contributions uh, from county employees for outstanding uh, service on particular issues and initiatives. And today, uh, it's my privilege to recognize over three decades of contributions to our organization. Um, where I'm going to try to make Alicia a little uncomfortable because that's just You've it's it. enjoyable. Now. I know <laughs> uh, she didn't ask for this, and uh, but she's tolerating it. I, but I really feel like our organization needs to recognize an individual who's given over three decades uh, of their life to this organization, to this community, in various roles. And so, um, bear with me here. Alicia started with Lane County in the same way she's ending as extra help. Right. <laughs> and uh, in 1986, she actually has retired and she's been working back with us to ensure a smooth transition as we're recruiting for her replacement. So next Friday is her officially last day with Lane County, and this will be her last board meeting here. Uh, so I want to take a minute to just share. Except some. when I come back for public testimony. Right. She's promised that she's coming. She gets her three minutes every Tuesday uh, to share her thoughts, and, and we look forward to that. At, uh, <laughs> that entertainment. Uh, okay, so Alicia started in 1986, and um, she started as the Employment and Training Supervisor uh, for the Southern Willamette Private Industry Council, which was part of Lane County at the time. Uh, she subsequently served as the Performance and Development Coordinator for Lane County, uh, then as the Director of the Department of Children and Families, uh, and then uh, in her current role as Director of Health and Human Services. So 30, she leaves with 31 years of experience and uh, beyond Lane County, um, she, as you all know, has been actively involved in this community in a number of ways. Um, and I'm sure each of you have your own uh, stories and experiences of working with Alicia in different capacities. But of course she served uh, on the 4J school board since 2007, so a decade on the Eugene uh, 4J school board. Uh, she currently serves as the vice chair of the school board, and of course she served as, as the chair in the past. She's a member of the Lane County Early Learning Alliance, the University of Oregon uh, President's Diversity Advisory Committee Council, a governor's appointment uh, to the Youth Development Council. Um, she, since 1999, from 1999 to 2006, she was a uh, board member for the Board of Directors for Mobility International, as she served on the City of Eugene's Human Rights Rights Advisory Committee. I'm just giving you like a small handful of the things that she's been involved with. Um, I don't know if you know this, but Alicia is an international toilet expert. 
That's a true statement. Uh, in 2002, she presented a workshop on universal and accessible bathroom design at the Asia Pacific Toilet Symposium in Japan. And uh, I love that story because she oftentimes will share with people that she is an international toilet expert. She's proud of this. And, uh, but Alicia has been an advocate, of course, in a number of ways in our organization, in our community across the country and internationally for uh, ensuring that all people have access to services, facilities, and opportunities. And um, to me, that is one of the great legacies that she is going to leave. She's been actively involved, of course, with our equity and access work internal to the organization, of course, with the City of Eugene on the Human Rights Commission. And as we've launched Lane County's external involvement in equity and access, she has been a leading force in that effort. I will say since the time that when I was interviewed, Alicia was on the panel, and one of the things that she probed me on was my knowledge and experience and commitment to equity and access. Um, and I think I certainly recognize that I needed to be more involved in that issue. And Alicia has been uh, one of the people who has really pushed me to find opportunities to move the needle on that issue and many others. Um, I have really, um, I will say that I have grown personally and professionally, be, professionally because of my working relationship and personal relationship with Alicia. Um, I've learned a lot from her. Um, I've been impressed uh, with her work to build the team that she has built in Health and Human Services. I think if you look across it, and we have a number of staff here, Karen Gaffney and Lisa Nichols, assistant directors, Ron Jelm, um, Andrew Musicant, and Jocelyn Warren, division managers, and Laura McCabe from uh, our community health centers are all here, and a number of other folks uh, who aren't here. If you look around that department at the division managers, we really have an, an outstanding team of folks. And last week, we had the opportunity to host six finalists for the director position. And I and many others found ourselves talking about the incredible shape that this department is in today and the amount of change that it's seen. So if you go back six years ago when this department was formed and youth services was a separate department and children and families was a separate department, they got consolidated into this large super department of health and human services. And then during that time, we saw um, the, was it 2013, uh, the adoption uh, the, of the Affordable Care Act of the federal government and the expansion of our community health centers from two community health centers to six. Um, we've seen significant change in youth services as the general fund has been constrained and, and new leadership come in there and some really outstanding work that's happened um, in that area. In behavioral health, we've seen the implementation of the Denver model of care. Uh, of our CHCs, I talked about the, ex the expansion there in public health. We've seen the work that's happening statewide on public health modernization. And now the work that Dr. Warren and Dr. Ludke are doing uh, with the Kresge Foundation uh, around population health uh, management. So just incredible things that are happening. And Anytime you see growth and significant growth and change, there's volatility and there's potential for real challenges. And one of the things that I think Alicia has brought to this department is her knowledge, experience, and passion for team building. The people that she's hired in leadership roles, the care that she's taken to bring those folks together and do really extensive leadership training with those folks and make sure that they're not just a collection of subject matter experts who do a great job in their field, but they really are functioning as a unit. Um, and, I see, and I've seen the work that she has done and the HNHS team have done um, become leading practices in our organization. So we're looking at things that they're doing in HNHS and saying, how can we replicate some of those things in the larger organization? The first annual leadership summit that we had in December of 2016 that brought around 200 of our um, leaders, managers, and supervisors around the organization was Alicia. I mean, she was the one that pushed for that because the county years ago had done similar efforts to do networking and, and leadership building in the organization with our leaders, and we hadn't done that for many years, and she thought it was something we should start doing again. And 
she brought that to me and I said, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's do it. And, and she really led the effort to make that happen. So these are, I could go on and on and on um, <laughs> with that, but I just wanted to, I really feel like the, the 31 years of experience, the roles that she has served in and the accomplishments that she has made are deserving of a few minutes at our board meeting when I know we'll have some time next week at your retirement recognition to uh, expand on all of this. But I have two things that I wanna share uh, with Alicia. One is a certificate uh, and I will read this. It says Alicia Hayes on this 18th day of July, 2017 in recognition of her distinguished service to Lane County. Throughout the past 31 years, including as Director of Health and Human Services and the Department of Children and Families Performance and Development Coordinator and Employment and Training Supervisor, as well as Interim County Administrator, which I did not mention. Uh, she has made Lane County a better organization and our community a better place through her tireless efforts to support the health and well-being of all people. And I will just mention, and I know the commissioners can speak to this as well, um, her role as interim county administrator during a really difficult time for this organization. She stepped up, and to me it's an example of uh, what she has done in each of these roles. When called to serve, she has stepped up, and in each case, I believe she's made the things she's touched better. And to me, that is the epitome of, pu of public service, that uh, we serve in these roles to make our organization, our services to the public, and our community better as a result of the things that we do. So the, the other thing I want to present is this uh, coin that we have made and given out. Devin gives me a hard time because we have a lot of these coins that we've, and we give them, and I, I'm very... Um, stingy? Stingy, yes. I, it's, we have, this is sparing. This is, we don't just toss these out. It needs to be really for something special. Um, I don't want it to be something that we just give to everybody. And um, uh, and so this is uh, uh, Alicia's services deserving of this. So on one side, we have the Lane County logo and our three priorities adopted by this board, uh, safe and healthy county, vibrant communities, infrastructure, Lane County, Oregon, since 1851. And on the other side, it says Lane County proud. And it has, I believe it's the Curry covered bridge. So Lane, Lane County proud is our our motto, and um, uh, and so this is our Lane County Proud, our pride coin. And to me, Alicia Hayes represents uh, the pride that our employees have in serving this organization and community, and, and I hope and believe the pride that our residents uh, feel in living in this community. So I wanna thank you for your service and uh, wish you all the best in a, um, a well-deserved retirement. Thank you. thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Hayes. Well, I, I do thank you, Steve. That was very kind. And if you do want to hear more about toilets, please, um, I'd, I'd be happy to share it another time. Explain John's law, please. Yeah, really. <laughs> you scare me sometimes. Um, but I, I just take a second to say it's been a great 31 years, the last uh, six with the folks I get to work with in Health and Human Services. It's a wonderful organization. And you do talk about pride. I am always happy to and have pride in telling people where I work and what I do and, and the work we do in Lane County. I joke about coming back uh, uh, for public comment. I'm not sure I will, but I'm not sure I won't uh, <laughs> because we have a lot ahead of us as I look down the road and see what's coming. And uh, I appreciate all of you. <clears throat> appreciate uh, really incredible opportunities I've had at Lane County. Um, when I looked for a job back in 86, um, if you remember what was happening with the recession, I, I had just moved here and I was supposed to be at Lane County for one year. It was a one year uh, stint, uh, they told me, uh, grant funded. And look, 31 years later, and that's what I tell people when they come to work here, it's a great opportunity. And thank you for everything uh, you do uh, to make that happen. Thank you, Alicia. Is it true that south of the equator, they swirl the other way? <laughs> <laughs> but it is true, oh, no, I don't even wanna get started. <laughs> uh, board, any uh, any remarks or comments or thanks for Ms. Hayes? Commissioner Lycan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, uh, Steve, I'm glad you mentioned the interim 
County Administrator piece. I, I was board chair at the time, and um, it was what was interesting is the haste that went on prior to that and uh, checking with legal counsel. I said, well, <laughs> what's our options here? And it turns out as board chair, I had the ability to appoint acting, but the commission had the vote on interim. And what was interesting about that is I had a couple names in mind, but part of it was I knew Alicia had a very strong deputy in Karen. And uh, from that perspective, as I was analyzing it, <clears throat> I thought, well, it made sense. Alicia, first of all, had the Lane County history, and uh, but her approach was really interesting because while she was the face, and, I, and this is how I, this is to me, is what I think of uncommon leadership in today's society. It really is. Because while Alicia was the face, she told me that she said, but here's the reality, Alex Gardner, Marcia Miller, Sheriff Turner, we were all into in this together and while she was the face that presented to the board and was in my view the true acting and interim administrator without a doubt it's that that ability to bring these folks together and really and and because as we were going through that we were it was it was a challenging time but i gotta tell you alicia steadied the ship and prepared it for Steve to hire, hire for us to hire Steve, and look where Lane County is today. And uh, Alicia, I, I, for me personally, I can't thank you enough because when I called you, you weren't. It's not like you said, "Yeah, boy, I'd love to do it." It was quite the opposite. It was, but it came down to, I love the county organization. If this is what you need, I will step in, and. It's, it's interesting because when you look at history, and, and I kind of like to look at military history, I like to look at generals. If you look at Patton and MacArthur, they were the leadership of, hey, look at me, hi, you know, Omar Bradley. <clears throat> One of the great generals in the history of the United States, but yet had that ability. He was just, he was called the, the, this, the soldier's general because of his ability to not only deal with folks in a high ranking position, whether it's foreign or whether domestic, but had the ability just to walk down the line and talk to the private. And frankly, it's that kind of leadership I highly respect. As you know, I don't fit that mold. <laughs> uh, the tie will tell you that, but, the, uh, but I just want to say uh, thank you very much, Alicia, for stepping up. And also for not only that, but having a very strong department that's in place now for the next person, they have a really, to me, a, a unique position to really kind of carry out. And one last thing I'll mention is that my favorite story, though, is I just love to hear about Alicia's red, white, and blue gun-toting son. <laughs> <laughs> We have time. You knew I. You knew I was going to come. Thank did you. I do? <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Lycan. Further, further comments, Commissioner Sorensen. Uh, well, I come not to bury Alicia, but to honor her. Uh, no, I. I think that this is a really momentous occasion, not just for Alicia and your 31 years of service to Lane County, but really for all the people you've mentored, all the people you've helped. And I, I totally agree with you. I think explaining to people that you were hired on a, you know, one-year grant to come to work with, uh, you know, people that lost their jobs in the recession and you were yourself going to lose your job <laughs> in a year and that that posed professional challenge for you to help these folks, but also to find your own path and what you are going to be doing. I think that's very inspirational to a lot of people who start out in government. Maybe they've had a career doing other things, but they don't entirely understand how, nor, nor do any of us really entirely understand how government works because it's always changing. But I think that you've just been a model administrator, model employee, just done a great job and always been a straight shooter and I just uh, just really appreciate your service and and also your uh, service to the broader community with the school board and your work there because I, I think that in in some ways we used to have a little broader um, uh, 
component to employee evaluations to include a professional involvement, be that international toilet design or not, uh, but a kind of a professional involvement uh, with issues that are that are involved in our work, the work itself, obviously the most dominant feature, but also something maybe more remotely called uh, community leadership or community involvement. And that could be what you've done, the school board, many other things, but it could be lots of things. I, I just wanted to say that I think that is a component of your, of your leadership here is that it's not all here, it's also stuff you've done for the bigger community. And um, anyway, thank you so much for your service to our, our community and to Lane County. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Sorensen. Commissioner Williams. Well, I haven't been on board for all that long, but uh, you and I first met some years ago. I remember uh, very fondly of running into you at the uh, in Salem a lot, state capital and other places, advocating on behalf of uh, the people you serve. And uh, I just want to wish you uh, Godspeed and enjoy, find something to do in retirement, because... Uh, Not showing up here to do public comment. <laughs> yeah, okay. But anyway, congratulations on uh, your 31 years, and I'm excited for you to turn that page to the next chapter of your life and uh, go for it. Thank you, Commissioner Williams. Commissioner Bozovich. Thank you, and Alicia, I want to just say congratulations and thank you for your service to the county. Um, lots of fond memories. I remember beating about uh, various priorities for our uh, public health improvement plan and uh, or the CHIP, I think it was, and I mentioned that we ought to really, if we're going to be effective about tobacco, we ought to restrict sales to folks under 21 and you're like, ah, that'll never happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, remember that? I do, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and, and I'll fondly remember the fact that I had that picture outside my office while you're interim county administrator that we both so fondly love. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so enough said. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Bozovich. You know, do we have a couple hours. Uh, no. But uh, Alicia, you know, last uh, Thursday, it was on uh, on the 6th, Thursday, uh, you and I had a meeting with your uh, management staff, leadership staff, once a month. And uh, and we had a little bit of a tearful meeting last um, Thursday, the 6th, when, you know, we I realized it was the last time that I'd be sitting in that group with you. Um, but thanks for the powerful team that you leave in place. More than anything else, you know, when a leader uh, looks behind after the last day on the job and you see behind you the kind of foundation that you have built that's what makes you realize that your work has been powerful strong and lasting and that's what it's been alicia powerful strong and lasting lasting you know i spent a little bit of time during the waning days of uh, a commission on children and families as a commissioner that's when i first met you and uh, well, actually when i first worked with you and uh, at that point i realized that you were something special that you could take a uh, normal agenda item and drive it into something powerful and long-lasting. Just this morning I was reflecting with uh, Karen, how uh, uh, Ms. Gaffney, how uh, having worked in the legislature, and we were talking about the legislature a little bit, and talking about the federal government, uh, I'm going to be carrying a, an order to, the, to uh, NACO next week, uh, to our health committee, um, and uh, how things go slowly. You know, and uh, so we've been working on CFR 42 for four years now, and maybe this is the time for it to happen. Well, we talked about how here in Health and Human Services at Lane County, things don't move slowly. When things are ripe, I think was the word, uh, it's time to pluck and and uh, and devour, right? Devour? There we go. We didn't say that, did we? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so and I look at the things that we've done as a, as a health and human services department uh, throughout the, the four plus years that I've been on the county commission. It's remarkable. And when I go to, uh, I'm on the uh, health committee with the, the Association of Oregon Counties, all other counties look to our county for leadership in health and human services, including poverty and homelessness and some of the other things that we are powerful in. When I uh, was back at uh, NACO a couple of years ago, um, 2015, I believe it was, and uh, we had a, a little bit of an outbreak at the University of Oregon on meningitis. Uh, the, there were people in the room from um, the 
the uh, CDC, uh, the Center for Disease Control. I think that's in Atlanta, right? And we'd got the news that morning. You'd got the news that morning. Well, they were already talking about Lane County's response. Uh, and this was in Washington, D.C., the day that you heard about it. So that, that's a type of, that's a type of um, response that we have come to expect from our health department based upon your leadership and based upon the leadership team that I see assembled in the audience today. So thank you. Thank you for what you did. Thank you for what you're doing. And thank you especially for what you have left behind. Thank you very much. And you're right. It is absolutely a team effort. It's great to be up here, but it, they do all the work. I just take all the credit. And thanks for this. You know, I've been um, coveting it. <laughs> I didn't realize I had to leave to get it, but <laughs> it's worth it. Thank what do I have much. to do to get one? <laughs> I hope we don't. Yeah, I don't want to set a precedent so here. Now. No one else. No, I need, I need to start find some people that are going to stay to give to. <laughs> no, no, it won't so. be a special. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. A heartfelt thank you from the entire board. Uh, Mr. Marker Heisk, any further, uh, any further business for the Board of Health? That's it. Then I'll adjourn the Board of Health meeting. Give the room a moment or two to clear before we uh, reconvene as the uh, Board of County Commissioners. I will convene this regular Tuesday, Tuesday, July 18th, regular meeting of the Board of County Commissioners. Mr. Mucker Heisk, any adjustments to the agenda? No. I see none. Um, then we'll uh, begin with public comments. We entertain public comments during the Board of Health meeting. Are there any further public comments this morning? I see none. Then we'll move along to Commissioner's response to no public comments, but uh, other issues or remonstrances. Board. Commissioner Lycan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and I appreciate Commissioner Williams reminding me of this and bringing this up, but um, I would like to just make quick mention um, about the fact that we lost yet another incredible icon in this community, and that was Don Tykeson. And uh, for those who had had an opportunity to meet Don Tykeson, what an incredible human being, for one, and what an incredible uh, um, just leader and just an incredible giver to this community. He uh, built what I would call a television and communications empire, but yet he remained local and remained here and continued to give back over and over to the community. And I'd like to read one thing that came from his um, obituary. And this is the kind of man he was. So think about it. He was 90 years old when he passed away, but this is... <clears throat> So an early definer for Don was his diagnosis with multiple sclerosis at age 30, 30 years old. This setback proved to be a catalyst, honing his desire to make a difference in the world and provide for his family. Don constantly sought and adopted leading edge thinking on managing MS. He focused on what could be and often referred to the disease as an old friend, one that pushed him to excel and concentrate on what mattered most. Pretty amazing because when you're diagnosed and you're hit that early of an age, you almost kind of want to step back and say, why me? Don used it instead as something to push him even more and, and to excel at what he did. Um, I, I got to know Don on a personal basis, I think with all of us here, and uh, truly one of the great leaders, and I just, I can't use a better word than icon in this community, and, and so sorry to see him pass away, but at 90 years old, he lived a very, very fruitful life. And I just wanna say thank you, Don, for all you did for not just our community, but for the state of Oregon, and really for our entire country, and the, the things you did for us. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Lycan. Further res responses, excuse me, no, uh, remonstrances? Commissioner, Commissioner uh, excuse me. <laughs> now I call Commissioner Sorensen, Commissioner Lycan. <laughs> Commissioner Sorensen. Thank you very much. Um, recently, House uh, Resolution uh, 438 was introduced in the U.S. House of Representatives, and it's probably not known as that. Uh, record because of uh, the seriousness of it. It was introduced by Representative Brad Sherman, who is a member of Congress from uh, San Fernando Valley and co-sponsored by uh, Congressman uh, Al Green of Houston, Texas. And this is the resolution that was introduced to call for the impeachment of President Trump. 
And uh, according to Representative uh, Sherman's website, uh, because this has now been uh, introduced and likely referred to the House Judiciary Committee, uh, it's going to be an opportunity uh, if the leaders of the House Judiciary take it uh, to investigate whether or not President Trump should be impeached or not. And over the weekend, I was reading um, an article by a Seattle businessman who uh, said it's gotten to the point where we've seen so much uh, inappropriate and illegal activity in the short period of time that President Trump's been in office that uh, we just have to put a marker down as to where in this period of history, where, where are we on this? Do we think this is acceptable or not? And uh, I think it's not. And I think that it's time for those of us in leadership positions to speak out on this and get our uh, members of Congress uh, really seriously interested in this. I I've know that this starts out as a partisan issue, uh, but really, I think it really rises to a not just a bipartisan issue, but a national issue that all of us should care about. So I'm, I'm bringing that up today because I think it's um, a horrible thing that people would say that about our elected president. But I think it's also accurate, and I think it's something that needs to be said, and leaders need to speak out on it at every level. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Sorensen. Further issues? Uh, just a couple of things quickly, Mr. Um, uh I had a chance to meet with Jack Wilson for a little while last night after there was a legislative um, update at uh, the Register Guard offices last night. And I had a chance to meet with Jack Wilson, who's one of the editorial boards at board editors. And uh, Jack has recently uh, composed a series of articles on homelessness in the Register Guard. There are no less than uh, 20 four articles. Um, and if you read this as a body, if you read these articles as a body, it is a fantastic read. Uh, Jack Wilson has done a very good job of digging deep into, into very specific elements of homelessness, poverty, poverty relief, and, uh, and uh, nutrition and hunger in our community. Very well done. And I'd like to commend Mr. Wilson for this series of articles. It's not finished yet. And uh, there may be some uh, weaving together of the articles, but uh, it really reads like a, uh, uh, like a, just a, a history of the current state of homelessness, poverty relief, etc., in Lane County. Uh, commend it very well. The other thing I did last night, I was busy last night after hours. I sat right about where Karen is, um, listening to the Eugene City Council meeting. So I spent. Uh, they they had a discussion on the uh, Envision Eugene and the, uh, the adjustments to the urban growth boundary. Uh, they had two ordinances that, that were, they worked on last night. One was on what they call jobs, uh, public lands and parks, excuse me, jobs, schools and parks. The other is on residential. On uh, jobs, schools and parks, they uh, chose to move forward with a, a modification to the urban growth boundary um, uh, in Clear Lake and out uh, in Santa Clara. Uh, as far as residential is concerned, they uh, passed an order that established the sufficiency of the Eugene urban growth boundary for purposes, purposes of residential. So that's the order they passed last night. It doesn't become an ordinance. It doesn't take effect until we, the Lane County Commission, uh, agrees with them word for word and passes that. And uh, we'll be discussing that on, on August 8th. A couple of quotes, however, that were a little bit um, curious in the meeting last night. There was a, quest a series of questions for uh, uh, City Council regarding, does Eugene actually have an urban growth boundary? The answer seemed to be no. Eugene doesn't have an urban growth boundary uh, because um, uh, a number of years ago, Springfield decided to redraw its urban growth boundary at uh, the Interstate 5 line, which made Eugene's growth, urban growth boundary uh, basically non-existent. So these, the orders they passed last night were to adjust the urban growth boundary, which council said uh, didn't exist. So I'm really curious about how we move forward with this. It's, uh, that a lot of questions need to be answered before we have discussions on August 8th regarding the action that the Eugene City Council took last night on Envision Eugene, which has been going on for seven years. Um, the council at one point uh, said, um, "We are creating the first Eugene, uh, the first we are creating the first UGB 
for Eugene only. We are creating the first UGB for Eugene only. That was council last night. So um, these questions will come up, and uh, I'll actually uh, formalize the questions with the, and hopefully Lane County staff can get some clarification because it left me a little bit wondering uh, what action the city of Eugene actually took last night. Uh, we'll be talking about it more on August 8th. So thank you very much. Any further items from council, from commission? Uh, seeing none, we will move along to uh, consent calendar. We have before us a consent calendar for July 18th, 2017. All, all items listed on the consent calendar are considered to be routine by the Board of Commissioners and will be enacted by a single motion. Do I have a motion? Commissioner Bozovich. I'll move approval of the uh, July 18th consent calendar for 2017. Second. Moved by Commissioner Bozovich, seconded by Commissioner Lykin. Discussion to the motion? I see none. I'll call for the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Passes unanimously. Thank you. And then we'll move along to uh, next item of business, which is, uh, let's see, page three. Um, on Health and Human Services, uh, Mr. Bumper, hi, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so we have an update on the community health centers of Lane County, and I'll just, uh, I mentioned this uh, as we talked about Alicia's retirement, the growth uh, and change that we've seen uh, in our community health centers growing from two clinics to six. Now we had a, a work session with the board in November of 2016. We talked about um, the progress that's been made with our community health centers as well as the uncertain and changing environment uh, as it relates to federal uh, health care laws. That environment, I think, is still uncertain and changing, so I don't know that we have any. Maybe uh, Karen and Ron and Lori will have more to say about that than, than I do, but I think uh, you know there's still a, a probably as much or more uncertainty about the future of health care in our country and here in our local community as there was uh, six or seven months ago. Um, I'll just say that um, I think our leadership and staff in the clinics from my seat have done a fantastic job of doing everything they can do to meet the needs in our community to provide uh, access, to expand access, to improve quality of care in our community, to integrate both uh, primary care and behavioral health services in the clinic setting. Uh, that is an ongoing and continuing challenge that we face. We spent uh, a fair amount of time yesterday uh, talking about provider recruitment and retention, and that's an issue that we continue to, uh, that will continue to be a challenge. Um, that is a priority that's on our plate, and we are all committed at this table um, to doing what we can do to make sure that we recruit and retain the highest quality uh, talent for our CHCs, and particularly with our providers. So I just wanted to say that we've talked about that in the past, about that challenge with recruitment and retention of providers. I know that uh, our team here will talk more about that, but I just wanted to offer from my voice that that is a priority uh, for us. And the uh, Karen and Ron and Lori and others have spent a significant amount of time really digging into that issue in, in particular. And so while we're not going to resolve that issue today, I wanted to just acknowledge that it's something that we're working actively on. So with that, I'll turn it over to Karen. Thank you. Um, good morning again, Chair Farr and uh, Commissioners. I'm going to start us off and then turn it over to Ron and Lori. Um, as, as the county administrator said, we met with you in November, um, post-election, lots of unknowns going into the legislative session and um, walked through with you some of what our thinking is as a department and asked for your feedback about some of our plans moving forward in terms of meeting community need. And at that time, we told you we would come back and visit with you again. Um, and some things have uh, become more clear in the environment. As, as Steve said, there are still some unknowns. I was checking these slides as recently as this morning to make sure that we were still up to date. Um, so we'll spend about 10 to 15 minutes um, giving you our update and then have reserved enough time to really hear from you about your thinking on our proposed strategy moving forward. So this morning I'll do a brief recap of our November um, presentation, uh, give you the updates 
updates we have about what's changed in the environment. Uh, Ron's going to talk about our financial sustainability and uh, the work that we continue to do on that contingency planning our unmet community needs, and then Laurie will really talk about our strategy moving forward. So let's start um, just with a refresher. I know, Commissioner Williams, you were not here in November to have that presentation, so we certainly won't go through all of that again, uh, but there are some highlights I want to remind us about. Um, as, as we said, there are six sites in our community health centers right now. We've had some rapid growth, which is wonderful. There is still unmet need in the community without a doubt, and we'll talk about that today. And um, when you look at our dental and primary care uh, business, we've served in excess of 30,000 people in the community. So uh, really our community health centers have become an integral part of the healthcare service delivery system in our community. Uh, as we've alluded, there remains lots of uncertainty. Back in November, we talked about uh, the conversation for appeal, uh, repeal and replace of the Affordable Care Act, um, and that's still a conversation, and um, state shortfalls going into an uncertain budget with the state. Um, we don't receive direct state grants for our program, but um, Medicaid expansion is a key piece for our community health centers. Back in November, um, we ran through with you some of the scenarios, uh, financial scenarios that we've been working on uh, and our strategies. We continue to really look toward building reserves so that whatever happens in that regulatory and funding environment, we have a cushion to allow us some options in terms of glide paths. So we continue to do that. Um, and. Uh, I would remind you that community health centers are not new in this country. Our, our work is about 11 years old in the community health center space, um, but nationally, I think it's in excess of 50 years now that community health centers have been supported, and they're supported by both sides of the aisle, and there really is no conversation um, in the federal environment about uh, reducing community health centers. Um, and then we gave you three specific scenarios that we're tracking on as possibilities in terms, particularly around that Medicaid expansion and the Affordable Care Act, and um, let you know that even in our worst case scenario, which contemplates a rollback of the Affordable Care Act to those 2014, um, pre-2014 levels, um, we really do have a financial plan that's viable at the CHC, and that piece hasn't changed. Um, and then finally, we talked about our near-term strategy in November was to put expansion to new sites on hold until we could get some more clarity about the environment, continue to build those reserves, and as the county administrator mentioned, focus on our provider recruitment and retention. Uh, make sure that our health centers are as strong as possible in this environment in terms of quality and infrastructure so that we're resilient regardless of what those changes are. So, updates on the federal and state landscape. Uh, the state landscape is a little more clear than when we met with you in November. The legislature did pass a provider tax uh, and an Oregon Health Authority budget that um, allows us to um, continue to forecast the same payer mix. You might recall in the community health centers, it's really critical for us, um, the payer mix of Medicaid versus self-pay and Medicare because we get that enhanced rate. Um, so at this point, uh, we anticipate continued Medicaid expansion. Of course, long-term, that is still dependent on what happens at the federal level. And in terms of the um, federal level, just this morning, uh, it looks like there's another um, bend in the road on the path of the Affordable Care Act, uh, and there's now conversation of perhaps looking at a complete repeal and um, what the um, temperature and support level may be for that moving forward. Um, I can't predict at this point, um, but certainly back in November, we thought at this point we might have already had a repeal of the Affordable Care Act, and that certainly has not happened. Um, and what became clear in the House version, at least, that did pass is a contemplation of some gradual reduction rather than a, an immediate cliff where people would lose their coverage. So again, that would provide us some time to um, do our contingency work. Uh, so a little more clarity. We still uh, have some things to learn. Ron? Thank you, Karen. 
So, well, this slide really is titled uh, Keys to Ongoing Financial Sustainability. Uh, we really could look at it in a broader context of organizational sustainability because all of these have themes that are important uh, for the organizational well-being and, and the clinical well-being of the populations that we serve. Uh, first, it, it, I think, is a real a tremendous opportunity in the way the industry is starting to think about compensating providers uh, for the health care services that they provide. Historically, providers, as we all know, paid fee-for-service is the, is the term. Um, I provide a service as a provider. I get paid for an office visit. I get paid for an injection. I get paid for uh, doing something invasive uh, to that individual who is sitting in front of me or standing in front of me or sitting on the exam table in front of me as a provider. What I don't get paid for is I don't get paid for necessarily improving the health of the patient who is sitting in front of me. And I certainly don't get paid for improving the population of the patient panel uh, who might be assigned to my practice or in the community. And I think one of the real wonderful opportunities that's come out of the coordinated care organization advancement here in Oregon um, is pay for performance, if you will, paying for the improvement of clinical quality measures. And uh, I know in our practice and I know throughout the state as a part of the Medicaid payment that is tied, historically was paid fee for service, has been put into payment for clinical improvement. And I absolutely know that that has moved the needle. Um, you know, Dr. Uh, a physician here in town uh, has said, you know, as a physician, um, I, my, my colleagues and I, we knew we did great service. And then we started to measure what we were doing. And you know, the service wasn't quite as good, the quality wasn't quite as good, because things were slipping through the cracks. Now that we're measuring those clinical indicators, uh, we've had improvement in the clinical performance, and now we can say with confidence that we're providing great care. And that is where um, that is where uh, we are moving. Uh, the CCO uh, metric payment, uh, as an example, uh, three years ago when that was instituted, uh, our component of that payment was a little under $700,000. Last year, that was $2.9 million. Um, that's a change in the way, not necessarily net additional payment, but the change in the way those dollars come in, and that's really important. So uh, as we move to uh, have uh, more reporting, more data uh, transparency that we can give to our providers, it really is improving care, and that's important for good care but also financial sustainability. Uh, the second component is that balance of uh, of balancing our payer mix. Obviously, as we look to potential changes in the Affordable Care Act, um, we're very concerned um, with the potential in terms of the financial impact of people coming off the Medicaid rolls and going on to uninsured. Uh, a number of years ago, we had 40 percent of our patients, uh, patient activity was uh, to uninsured individuals. That's now down into the low, uh, into the low single digits. Now, we are absolutely committed to continuing care for those individuals if they lose their insurance. Um, and it will have a financial impact on us uh, because we will lose payment. The, the bigger impact on the personal basis, quite frankly, will not be the change in payments of the community health center. It will be the change in the access to care that those individuals have. The, we will provide primary care. What will uh, be diminished is their access to hospital care, their access to specialty care, the access to alternative care, physical therapy, and others. You know, that's, that's also an important component uh, of that. Um, a, a third component is moving to alternative payment arrangements. I made uh, a, a comment about changing from fee-for-service. Um, where we are uh, going, I think where we will be uh, three to five years from now, is not uh, even fee-for-service or some incentive for uh, clinical measures, but more on a capitation per member per member or, or per member per month uh, basis. And, and that provides uh, even greater opportunity for a lot of the services, quite frankly, that we are already providing in terms of case management, care coordination, um, and, you know, 90 percent of what impacts the individual's health happens outside of the medical environment. And, and that is where I think the community health center, I know the community health center has uh, more resources. And because we're in health and human services, uniquely 
uh, qualify us, should uniquely qualify us, to the vulnerable population that we serve to deal with issues of homelessness, to deal with issues of food insecurity, um, those things that happen outside of our doors. Uh, and the alternative payment approaches actually will provide some level of compensation and flexibility for us to deal with those things. Um, and then um, the last issue is provider recruitment and retention. Uh, we've been successful. Uh, we're bringing on another uh, uh, two physicians who will be joining us within the next a couple weeks and some additional integrated behavioral health staff. Uh, but that uh, provider recruitment and retention continues to be a challenge uh, for us. As uh, uh, Mr. Mokarhyski uh, indicated, we're, we're working on looking at different alternatives uh, that might uh, uh, provide some other options for us and, and uh, continue to uh, ensure that we're competitive in the marketplace to bring uh, physicians and other providers into uh, our organization. Um, you know, one of the challenges uh, uh, is that, you know, physicians, even physicians right out of uh, school, uh, are not looking to work full time. Um, they are uh, maybe working uh, 30 hours, 32 hours uh, a week. And, and what that means for us in, in our current environment, for every FTE, for every full-time employee uh, that we want as a provider, uh, we have to recruit about 1.4 or 1.5 individuals. Uh, so that just gives you a sense uh, of the challenge that we face. And uh, the Health Resources and Human uh, Services Administration uh, predicts a shortage in primary care physicians nationally in, in the next three years of over 20,400 uh, primary care physician shortage. So that gives you a sense of, uh, of kind of what we're up against. Uh, tremendous unmet uh, need in the community. Um, you're very familiar with the needs here. Um, the uh, CHIP uh, has highlighted ongoing need in our community for primary care. Um, ongoing need, 100% health. Um, it, it, you know, we, we have done a lot with the Affordable Care Act in improving access to care, uh, but if there is a detriment in the, in the Affordable Care Act, um, the safety net clinics, of which we are one, will play an integrally important part of continuing to provide care. And so we are um, very closely invo involved with the United Way and many of our community colleagues in looking at that. Uh, needs uh, in rural communities, we haven't forgotten that. You know, our phone rings uh, on a constant basis. Uh, folks in the rural communities saying, you have six clinics, that's great. Um, and in fact, I might be coming in from West Fur or Oak Ridge or, you know, any uh, of the outlying areas to get a care in one of your six clinics here in Eugene uh, or Springfield. But how can you uh, improve access in the rural community? And that continues to be an unmet need. Uh, and then dental services. Um, Lane Community College and others, individual of, uh, physicians, provide access uh, to dental care, to full-service dental care, uh, but that continues to be an unmet need. It's an area that, uh, that uh, we are, are looking at uh, and may explore at some point in the future um, because we know dental health is so integrally uh, tied uh, to overall health. So now, Lori will give you a, a nickel's worth on, on where we are in our current strategy and the updates uh, from November. And just a nickel. The current strategy is really to just grow in place, but not really just grow to bloom. So we are looking at our Charnelton location downtown, uh, remodeling that space to really make it um, a more improved space for team coordination, for efficiency. So we're looking forward to improving that space. At our Brookside Clinic, we are working on a lease um, of the, some newly available space at that location to add alternative medicine. And so we're excited about that. Not only um, securing that space for that new program, but also to protect the option to grow our Brookside Clinic at some point. So if we can secure that space, then perhaps we can grow our primary care services at that site as well. So, and then at our Lane County Behavioral Health site, we are adding another physician. Actually, we're adding a physician to our Charnelton site and going to transfer a nurse practitioner 
over to our Lane County Behavioral Health site so that we can increase access to services at that site as well. Is that in addition to another physician or is that? We're, we're hiring a new physician and that physician will be placed at Pendleton <clears throat> and then we're transferring a nurse practitioner uh, who was working one day a week at our Lane County Behavioral Health site who they'll work her full entire schedule there. So that will be great for us. <clears throat> And then as far as new services go, we are adding uh, alternative medicine for our patients, uh, specifically focused around pain management needs. And that's in conjunction with our commitment to help reduce our um, use of opioids. So um, pain management is a huge component of the care that is uh, provided at the community health centers. So we're excited just to have another tool in the box quite honestly, to be able to offer alternative care, um, acupuncture and mindfulness, and uh, just to have some additional resources to help care for those individuals. So we're looking forward to that expansion and, and adding that service. And then our Soy Sono program, uh, which serves children, uh, special populations of uninsured, uh, that program then uh, changes and in January becomes Cover All Kids. We're excited about um, just being able to continue with the services that we have, uh, to grow those, to improve those around efficiency and um, performance. So Chair Farr, um, just to sum up, I would say that um, despite how much time has passed, there's still enough uncertainty in the environment that our um, our recommendation in terms of strategy moving forward is that we continue to focus on our current sites and really strengthen the work that we're doing there. Um, and that includes the recruitment and retention piece as well as the quality piece that Ron was talking about. Um, and, uh, and keep some of the demand for a new rural clinic at bay uh, until we get a little bit more clear about our federal financing into the future. And in no way do I want to minimize the need that's out there, and I think that's a piece of the discussion with you. Um, certainly I know one of your priorities for our community health improvement plan uh, for this three-year period is to really look at addressing access to primary care and behavioral health services. So we absolutely will continue to do that work um, and at this point it probably would not include an additional new clinic site um, in this next year um, but certainly if things change in the environment we would anticipate coming back to you and talking with you more about that uh, so that's the grow in place how do we become as strong and resilient and really meet that community demand in our current sites Thank you, Ms. Gaffney. Thank you for the great presentation. Before I open it for discussion, um, a quote that I wrote down, even in the worst case scenario, we still have a financial plan that's viable to operate the community health centers. Um, and then we went on to describe what viable actually means, the diminished service, the diminished uh, uh, types of services that we'd be able to uh, uh, provide or, or, uh, or prescribe for our, for our patients. So we'll, we have a discussion. Uh, Board of Commissioners, a discussion to the issue. <clears throat> so it sounds pretty positive overall. Is that a fair statement? Yeah. Um, and I think that one of the uh, great things as part of your report is that there seems to be rather strong support, bipartisan support for community health centers um, in Congress, and you've been picking that up. Uh, what is the impact of the proposed uh, president's proposed budget in the health and human services arena on the uh, on, on our community health uh, center. In other words, they're I, I realize that they've been largely, you know, Congress has largely said we're not going to adopt that budget. But in the event that that were that budget were adopted, the proposal, what impact would that have on the operation of this work. Do you want 
Okay. So I'll, I'll start and then um, Ron can absolutely fill in. It's the first piece I would want to say is as a Department of Health and Human Services, there are huge impacts in that proposed budget. Um, so perhaps if the board has interest at some point, I'd be happy to come back and walk through those um, because a lot of those impacts are in divisions other than our community health centers, but absolutely have an impact on the health of people. As Ron talked about, those social determinants of health, um, particularly I think about Steve Manila division um, in human services would have huge impacts um, from that proposed budget. Um, so Ron, do you want to talk about specifically anything for the community health center? That goes into effect uh, theoretically October 1st. Right. Um, I think the biggest, uh, the biggest potential impact, uh, a couple. Um, one is uh, whether that budget is, Im is implemented or not. Uh, there is actually um, uh, the equivalent of a fiscal cliff uh, for the uh, grant funding for community health centers, federally qualified health centers, uh, in September. Uh, the uh, way that that legislation is written is that that requires uh, a, a uh, annual renewal uh, each year for those grant funds, um, and uh, all of our congressional uh, delegation have signed on to letters of support uh, for the enabling legislation to continue uh, that grant funding, uh, but that would, if that were not continued, that would have a significant impact. That's about 9% of our overall funding is grant funding. Historically, nine. 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 Uh, historically, that has had broad uh, bipartisan support, um, and um, reading the tea leaves, and I'm not uh, 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 so um, uh, wisdom, uh, full of wisdom and reading those tea leaves in Washington, but uh, every year they have come close but have always uh, supported the advancement of that grant funding. I think what is at more jeopardy, uh, well, there is broad bipartisan support of federally qualified health centers uh, and the support of the funding for those health centers in the grants that we receive. Uh, there sometimes is a disconnect uh, between those grant funds and the support of the health centers and the support of Medicaid. Seventy percent of the individuals who we serve uh, have Medicaid. Um, and you can't uh, disassociate one from the other. And so if there were a, a, a significant uh, diminishment of the Affordable Care Act, uh, that would have a significant impact, obviously, on federal health quali federally qualified health centers across the country. And so that's an area of more concern to us than, uh, than, uh, than the budget. And one other uh, threat that I haven't heard discussed, and that is that um, Two years ago, the uh, Congress passed a debt ceiling uh, increase that I believe is expiring in, um, well, the headline I have is U.S. Senate passes two-year budget deal through March 2017, averts government shutdown and debt default. And so I've been asking myself, uh, members of our legislative, federal legislative delegation, well, okay, if this deal was done in October of uh, 2015 uh, and extended through March of 2017, here we are in July of 2017, uh, when are we hitting the debt ceiling violation and what the what is the impact of that on our community health centers um, haven't seen much written about. I don't really know if if it's going to be a conservative group that complains that we haven't hit the clock or what. I really don't know, but I I do see that as being a very serious thing that could cause a more radical reduction in federal money because of the clock having run out in March or April or May or June or July or August. I think I saw where uh, Majority Leader McConnell was going to schedule a vote on this in August, but that was two weeks ago. And I just wonder, in your circles where you're constantly monitoring the proposed budget, as you just explained, and the, and the added issue of, of the annual grant cycle, um, are you involved at all, or do you have any intel on 
on this topic. This is another threat. Um, yep. Chair Farr and Commissioner Sorensen, I, um, I will say it's not um, a particular focus in our circles. I know there's some controversy about um, how the accounting for that debt ceiling is happening in Washington, D.C. Um, it's always an issue around cash flow for us. As you know, we get a lot of our revenue is um, federal dollars. And so to the extent that there's a shutdown, we worry about that. I think on the community health center side, um, as Ron said, our actual grant from the federal government is a pretty small part of our budget. So in terms of our revenue flow, we're dependent largely on Medicaid and as an entitlement program um, that I would say the CHC is probably less impacted than many parts of our department might be if there were a, a shutdown. And, and typically it really is a cash flow issue. Those are in the past have been relatively short lived concerns. And so I think that we could weather that. Thank you for that reassurance. <laughs> uh, small though it may be. Um, and 9% is uh, our rent uh, yes. dependency, is that correct? Further discussion? Commissioner Lycom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, if you could kind of, what I heard was that the number is 20,000 as a shortage of Physicians, is, did I hear that correctly? And over what? What's the time period? That, that is what the Health uh, Resources and Service Administration is predicting uh, by the. So that's predicting. Uh, predicting the by the year 2020. 2020. So not that far away. No, it's not. Uh, um, and uh, and that is the national shortage of primary mm -hmm. care practitioners. Okay. So this is the okay. So PCs, and um, the other uh, question I had is on the. Um, Opioid use issue, and how well prepared are the clinics right now in dealing with that? And so, when you have patients that are obvious that are maybe going through this, are, are we prepared enough to handle this? Do you think right now, and and are we prepared to handle it into the near future? We are we are dealing with it uh, right now. We have been dealing with mm -hmm. it um, uh, for many years. Um, and what we are doing to um, enhance the service is really a couple um, uh, main initiatives. Uh, one that uh, Lori indicated is expanding the range of alternatives uh, rather than just saying no uh, to someone's opioid uh, prescription to have alternative medicine, complementary medicine, and other services that we can uh, provide to them. Uh, the second uh, is actually providing Suboxone, uh, which is an alternative uh, 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 pharmaceutical treatment uh, to opioid use. We have a couple of our physicians who are already uh, providing a Suboxone uh, treatment, uh, and a number of our other physicians will be going through the continuing medical education and the certification to be able to do that. So that is um, a second main initiative. And then the third, uh, um, it, which we have been doing uh, for many years now, is, is uh, having a wellness committee having a mechanism by which uh, we um, standardize, if you will, the, the treatment uh, so that we provide support uh, to our providers uh, as they are looking to manage uh, the opioid use, that we are monitoring uh, the prescriptions uh, that are being provided so that we can provide education uh, and really support to those primary care practitioners because we are seeing those folks who come in. Um, and and they continue, we continue to see more and more um, uh, of need in the community. So a, a good friend of mine, and when I'm hoping that we will see in as far as uh, recruiting talent, uh, a good friend of mine, he, he is a, uh, has gone on, he's an RN, and uh, he lives in Houston. And he had definitely had options. I mean, he, he was a uh, decorated Green Beret was a medic and uh, so he had several options really to pursue one of the one, of course when you're in Houston one of the places you want to get on with right away is MD Anderson you want to try to but then he found out quickly is that well if you want to have a quality of life you may not want to go to MD Anderson because uh, what he was mentioning to me was um, <clears throat> they really ask you to work long, long hours, and if you complain, and they just remind you, well, great, there's 30 people right over there ready to take your spot tomorrow. And so he chose to go to work for, they have a county-operated hospital, mm -hmm. working there. 
And he said, salaries maybe not quite as much. You're a government employee. You have retirement. And he said, the quality of life is absolutely worth it. So when I view that, when I heard that, I'm thinking, well, maybe that's going to be an, a real possibility for coming to work for uh, for us, for for county government, for for our quality, for our our clinics, is the fact that you may not get that big salary you're going to get maybe at a you know a large private organization or whatever the case may be, but hopefully the quality of life. And actually spending time with your family and so on and so forth will outweigh that. And uh, so he has given me a little bit of hope that that's a real option out there. But um, but I think on, on the uh, opioid use, I just wanted to just to clarify that and make sure that you feel like that you have the personnel and the, the tools in place to deal with this ongoing, I mean, not right now, but obviously ongoing, because as as we know, this this continues to be a real issue and a hot button. I think for for every community that you can possibly imagine throughout the country. So it, it I, is. I appreciate actually, that. It is. It is one of those areas, uh, Commissioner Lycan, where <clears throat> there uh, there are uh, now being more uh, funds available specific for that use and and a case in point. Uh, we will be, uh, we anticipate we'll be filing for a, a grant uh, opportunity of $150,000 uh, from her, so that was just announced recently. Uh, and that will enable us to add uh, one FTE uh, uh, mental health specialist, uh, uh, KDAC, in the methadone treatment program so that they can expand uh, their services. It will also provide uh, some additional one time funding uh, to enhance our information services and data uh, reporting capabilities so that we can better integrate the records of the methadone treatment program with our primary care practitioners. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Lycan. And we'll be receiving a, re a report on that grant application tonight at the Community Health Council meeting, I do yes, believe. So, that, and and Commissioner um, Chair Farr and Commissioner Lycan, I, the other kind of coming attraction I'll let you know about is on August 1st, uh, the Board of Health asked for a briefing around substance use, and so we'll be back again, and, and certainly opiates are a big piece of that discussion, um, as well as, I think, the, the grant that Ron's talking about. Mm -hmm. And uh, Laurie had mentioned alternate medicine um, mm -hmm. that we're beginning to expand into, and, I, and later I may have a question regarding how uh, federal support may affect alternate medicine. Commissioner Bozovich. Thank you. So I, I really like the idea of the, the pay for performance uh, and the kind of change in the culture of providing medical care. One of the things I'm interested in is as you're, you know, participating in the CCO, which, you know, Peace Health and, and uh, other hospitals are, are participating with, are you hearing that there's an actual reduction in emergency room usage as primary care? So... Um <laughs> Chair Farr and Commissioner Bozovich, let me start. And then Ron actually, um, in his role at Trillium, is on the compensation committee that looks at a lot of the performance metrics in our community, one of which is, of course, to decrease emergency department use. So, um, so that is absolutely a key driver of what we're looking at in our community. And what I will tell you is we have not reached our goal yet on that. Ron? Uh, no, we haven't. I wish I could say otherwise. Uh, but what I can uh, say as an example is we are getting more tools that will enable us in, in real time uh, to intervene. An example is there's a, a system called uh, ED, EDIE, uh, Emergency Department. Somebody will help me with that acronym. Um, that will enable us uh, to identify uh, who has been in the emergency room and who, um, and actually connect into our electronic health record. And, and rather than have the provider have to look that up, to actually ping um, and say, oh, um, uh, here are patients on your panel who were in the emergency department yesterday. Um, so that provides better real-time access to be able to intervene. The other thing that that uh, will enable us to do is historically, we, quite candidly, 
we didn't necessarily know who among our population uh, of assigned patients went to the emergency room. We didn't get that information. We didn't get it in a timely way. Um, and to the extent that we got it, we might be dependent upon Trillium or other payers uh, to have that run through their claim system. That might take a couple months. And then they run it through a report, and that might take another couple months. And four, five, six months later, we might get a, a list of uh, who had been to the emergency room and who are the frequent flyers. Well, this system now gives us the capability, along with the Tableau software that we have recently purchased, to uh, pull that information, to uh, accumulate it, uh, massage it, and look at it. And I was looking with uh, Micah Brown, uh, our, um, uh, our information uh, clinical services uh, supervisor, uh, day before yesterday, uh, with just one of our teams who were the frequent flyers in emergency department utilization over the last 12 months? Um, we had one patient uh, who had been in the emergency room 50 times, almost once a week in the last year. Well, you know, th that information, uh, now we had probably added, I know we had added all the information that this patient was going, but without that capability to pull that out, uh, and now we can give that type of information back to the clinical care teams to go, what's going on with Ron that he's going into the emergency so many times? How can we intervene? And that's where I think some of the alternative payment gives us a real benefit because we can have patient care coordinators and others start to intervene with Ron to find out what I'm doing. And I'll give you an example. One of the parents, actually, of our uh, in our PED team, the patient care coordinator, this little kid was getting taken to the emergency room uh, on a pretty regular basis for asthma or whatever. Well, it really wasn't a problem with the child. It was, it was an issue with a new mom. And the patient care coordinator put together a process where mom could make a telephone call once a week with the patient care coordinator or any time she had an issue. And that child's uh, uh, emergency department visits, you know, fell off the table in a good way because mom had access not to a physician, not to a nurse practitioner, to a patient care coordinator who had a listening ear and the ability to say, I think that's okay, or, you know what, let me connect you with, you know, Dr. Um, uh, Grenier and, and we can figure out what's going on with that child. I think I might add um, the software that Ron talked about uh, that really Trillium enabled us as a community to have access to that emergency department information. It's not only being rolled out at the community health centers, but at behavioral health as well. I was at their all staff meeting last week and they did the same exercise of putting it up on the screen. And um, from a behavioral health perspective, they're able to see who amongst their clients are showing up in the emergency department and in inpatient care and getting those records. And it really improves our ability to coordinate care and, and is a tool um, to help drive those numbers down. And I guess the other tool I might lift up, again, we have that broader lens of health. Um, our FUSE project in this community, the Frequent User System Engagement, is specifically targeted at those individuals who have inappropriate use of the emergency system and are our most intensive users, and um, we're thrilled that uh, given the work that the state legislature did this year, that we're able to continue that work, hopefully grow that work with our partners at Trillium and Peace Health and others um, to include more people in that effort to know that if we house those people who are unhoused, uh, we can absolutely expect their emergency department usage to go down. Great, and I, I really appreciate that. And I was, if you hadn't mentioned Fuse, I was going to, because it is the interaction now between, you know, our, our health clinics and our and our coordinated care organization, and then also our human services division, and 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 getting to that intensive case management for those frequent users, whether it's folks that are showing up in booking in our jail more often, or whether it's folks that are showing up in the emergency room. It's usually a need for intensive case management, and that's what that project's trying to provide, as well as our, um, our, our you know, housing first uh, assisted housing project that we're looking at will provide that intensive case management, and, and hopefully we'll start seeing those numbers in, at the emergency room turn, turn around eventually. Um, you know, it, it, 
you also brought up, you know, all the, your recruitment issues, and you even had had one of your bullet points about rural recruitment. And I, as I was thinking about that, I attended a meeting in Florence where they had had three primary care providers leave the community, you know, bing, 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 and, and uh, Peace Harbor was having a community meeting to answer the community's questions about what they were doing to try and recruit those people. And it was a pretty intensive effort that, that Peace Health, you know, the Peace Health, Peace Harbor folks were making, <clears throat> including paying off student loans, you know, like a hundred thousand dollar student loan payoff over a certain number of years. Um, so it, it's we're not just trying to do our own recruitment for our clinics. Everybody in Lane County and of course nationwide are facing the same issues. So we're in competition with each other, uh, and it's going to be a continuing problem until we start educating and graduating more primary care providers out into our community. Uh, and that's something, you know, we've had an effort at, at, you know, to try and get Peace Health to get a teaching program here in Lane County. So we're actually graduating primary care providers in Lane County that want, want, want to stay here instead of having to recruit from outside. So hopefully, uh, well, the next legislative session, maybe we can work a little bit more on that, that whole aspect of trying to train our, our primary care providers locally because then we don't have to worry about whether they they're used to a rainy winter right. they'll fall in <laughs> love with us <this> <laughs> well uh, Lori does a, an extraordinary job she really is our point person in recruiting and she does yeoman service in uh, in, in selling uh, the organization and selling the community and it really is a great uh, place uh, to be uh, you know, once we get people here, especially we get them this yeah, time of year. this kind of weather is great. <laughs> it's, it's uh, great. You try to strike. Uh, as I promised, Ms. Mokoraisky, this is normal. <laughs> <laughs> this time of year, does it? <laughs> Commissioner Williams. Nothing. Then uh, just a couple of things before. Great, uh, great report, and thanks for the reassurance that you're providing. You know the stable leadership and the uh, ongoing pro uh, care provision that you're uh, you're essentially uh, reassuring the board that we are going to move forward with it. Um, <clears throat> so there are a lot of things to talk about, and um, and the uh, the thing that really stands out to me, and the thing that I hear about most outside of our community is um, that. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. All of our primary care sites include providing the following services, full service adult pediatric primary care, integrated behavioral health, and reproductive health. So integrated behavioral health under the same roof uh, in all six clinics. That is something that isn't, um, isn't practiced as broadly elsewhere as we're able to do it here. And, and I hear from uh, providers, from uh, case workers, everybody who is involved uh, cites the importance of being able to provide both services under the same under the same roof. So I I, uh, I enjoy being able to uh, tag on to that when people want to hear want to talk about our community health centers and the work that we're doing. I had a chance uh, last week to visit um, to visit our uh, uh, the uh, LCBH um, clinic. And uh, that surprised me. It, I really, had a, I didn't have a, I'd never been in that particular wind of, wing of LCBH before. The uh, the attitude in that wing. I, I went in there feeling okay, came out just feeling like a million bucks because everybody's in such a good mood there. They're 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 enthusiastic about their work. They're enthusiastic about their ability to reach patients, and they're very enthusiastic about the fact that their patients are in the same building as. Uh, um, because of the uh, behavioral health f uh, facility that's associated with it. Uh, it's uh, good for me to hear uh, Commissioner Bozovich talking about our MLK, our Housing First project that is uh, uh, gradually moving closer to the front burner uh, as we identify you know, funding gaps, et cetera. And uh, very excited about the fact that uh, we will be able to house folks who otherwise are visiting the emergency room up to 50 times a year. You know, it's, uh, um, it, it is pretty exciting that we're moving forward in a proactive fashion, not only Commissioner Lycan with, uh, with opioid use and uh, alternate medicine, but actually providing uh, care for people who otherwise seek care in a far more expensive, less efficient fashion. So I'm uh, very excited about what's happening with our community health centers, uh, excited about the uh, reassurance that we are going to um, continue to provide, uh, we have a financial model in place to continue to provide services. Anything else you need to add today? 
Uh, I would just add, uh, uh, Commissioner Lycan, um, uh, to your question, Commissioner Farr of the Board of Health, uh, I too am uh, devolved uh, from a percussionist to a drummer. <laughs> <laughs> there, is, there is one last bullet point that I had on my list. <laughs> I live with a drummer, or I, our son is a drummer too, and I, I know it tests everybody's patience until they get very good at drumming. Um, <clears throat> at dental care, you know, and uh, you know, we think about um, dental care as kind of an ad adjunct to providing physical health care, and really, there are more cases of people having issues with dental health than uh, than regular, you know, than the rest of their body. So. Can I have that same kind of assurance that we have a financial plan in place to continue our dental care? I, I can provide absolute assurance for uh, our preventive dental services as, as they exist today. Uh, a, as you know, we do uh, tremendous work going out into the schools and the WIC and the Head Start programs to provide uh, uh, preventive ser services, fluoride varnish and uh, sealants. Mm -hmm. um, the state, uh, uh, in its uh, wisdom, is pushing sealants more than they are uh, fluoride varnish. Uh, I'm not uh, clinically qualified to uh, make the comment as to what rather than the other. Uh, some who have more knowledge than I in that area say that I'm sealants, parentally qualified. <laughs> say that sealants are not necessarily uh, better than fluoride varnish, uh, but I will say that they take a lot more time. And as the state metrics are targeted to sealants, uh, one of the uh, perhaps unintended consequences is you can see uh, and, and provide care for fewer kids uh, with the same staff doing sealants rather than fluoride varnish. So that's a component that we're, we're struggling with in terms of uh, maintaining the same volume of services that we have historically. Uh, but there continues to be tremendous support in the community for that program. Uh, I think where we uh, are looking, as I mentioned, uh, in the future is not only sustaining that program, but also thinking about ways in which we can do more uh, intervention, uh, brief intervention services within our primary care clinics in the same way that we do uh, with integrated behavioral health with that brief intervention, but then also looking in the future to say how at some point in the future can we provide full service dentistry. Uh, many of our community health center peers uh, nationally uh, have full service den dentistry integrated within the services that they provide and, and, and that's a tremendous uh, service. We're not there yet, but uh, that is uh, a, a real need. Uh, and because so many insurers view that as an add-on, you know, it's not, well, it is uh, an integral part of the Medicaid program. Most health insurers, you know, it's, it's an extra package. And so even uh, commercially insured individuals very often don't have full dental care. Thank you very much for that addition. And uh, as we finish up, uh, it's hard for me to not look in the back of the room, back of the room and, and thank Ms. Hayes for her work and, and giving us such a strong uh, foundation at the CHE. And also, um, Lisa Nichols is sitting in the back of the room uh, from Behavioral Health Services, and uh, integral health care is, uh, is what it's all about, and that's what we do very well in Lane County. Mr. Mulker, Mr. and panel, thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for the support that you've provided us. Thank you. Thanks. Excellent. Give the room a moment to clear. Moving along, um, County Council, do we have any announcements? I see no council present in the... Yeah, the County Council's uh, not available today and has no announcements, and I'm happy to hold on my announcements so we can take care of um, 8B and the folks that we have here. Perfect. You've been patiently awaiting, but it's a great presentation. You must feel more comfortable having heard it. Um, so today we have before us Order 1707-1807 in the matter of amending Lane Manual Chapter 60 to revise revise provisions pertaining to disposal of unclaimed personal property. M Mr. Mokraisky, can you introduce the panel, Mr. Sindel? Uh, I'll turn it over to Robert Tintel, our finance manager. Thank you. Good morning, Chair, Commissioner Farr, Commissioners. Um, Robert Tintel, Financial Services Manager. Um, Captain Chris Doyle with the Lane County Sheriff's Office. Good morning. We're here today to 
mainly talk about a housekeeping or an update item for Lane Manual 6405. It's for the disposal of unclaimed personal property and county-owned surplus property. Last time we updated this was back in 2005, so it's been a number of years and technology has changed. And so there's a few major or minor revisions, housekeeping items with this. The first one is we cleaned up language, we clarified language regarding preferential consideration for when we uh, work with cities, school districts, and other local agencies when disposing of surplus property. This really clears of, clarifies it, so we, we give preference from the smallest to the largest. Um, in size. It's, it's a little less ambiguous. There's no substantive change to the manual in that regards. Secondly, we added language so that um, it allows us to uh, dispose of items less than $1,000 with a fair market value of $1,000 or less through an electronic, publicly available electronic marketplace. What that means is Craigslist. Essentially, the way it's currently written, it should be a sealed bid process. This allows us to use a non-sealed bid process and post it online as well for those items valued at $1,000 or less or items that have gone through the public auction and did not sell. And so it gives us a way to easily dispose of those as well. Finally, the third thing that this uh, revision includes is the disposition of police dogs. So dogs that are no longer serviceable, uh, the sheriff can um, release those to the handler um, or another uh, manner advisable to the sheriff as well. And that's why we also have a sheriff's office representative here in case there are any questions with any of those. That's a summary of the highlights of the revisions, but if you have any questions, we're here to answer those for you. Thank you, Captain Doyle. Anything you'd like to add, particularly about the last latter item? No, we uh, we just think that this is a great way to take care of our retiring canine friends, and so. We, you know, I think it's a great way too. Thank you. Uh, for the board, any questions or comments? Um, really, this is more about the canine than anything else at this point in time, and uh, so Craigslist is not a good way to do the canines. <laughs> All right, I would agree with that. Then, uh, with no questions, we have before us Order 17-07-1807, Commissioner Bozovic. Commissioner Williams. Well, I beg your pardon, Commissioner Williams, prior to the motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, question on number seven, disposition of firearms. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a sentence in here, all seized concealed weapons must be disposed of in accordance with Oregon law. And it talks about other uh, other firearms sales at auction or destruction or donated to other agencies. Uh, can you ex kind of clarify for me, um, are concealed weapons handled differently than other other weapons? I, that, that was a little confusing to me. Uh, th this is certainly not my area of expertise. Uh, I'd, um, and... I'm not. I'm not prepared to to, to talk about this. It, if uh, all can we have well, counsel who may be prepared, <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> Sorry, oh. Chair, Commissioners, uh, Jim Cheney, County uh, Assistant County Counsel. I'm not prepared, but um, like Woodrow Wilson, I'm. I, I will speak regardless. <laughs> um, <laughs> We never do There's that. a famous quotation from, Wood, from Woodrow Wilson where when asked to speak, he asked for how long because the shorter the period of time, the more time he needs to prepare. <laughs> in this case, being unprepared. Um, <clears throat> in the disposition, disposition of firearms, this is the, there's no change to the wording on this particular item here. This is but what has been done before. Um, the, seals, the seized concealed weapons are disposed of. We have a contract with a uh, licensed uh, commercial gun dealer in Portland. Uh, that thoroughly vets uh, the sales of all your thing. Uh, if anything, they're either destroyed or they're disposed of in a particular way there. And that's the only, that's, that's what that reference is there. And that was the authorization to go ahead and do that. Thank you, Mr. Cheney. Does that cover your question? Yeah, more or less. My, my curiosity was basically if there was a, a difference between um, say somebody uh, having a rifle stolen out of their garage or their house, um, that is, as I read this, treated a little differently than if somebody is 
has uh, been frisked, for example, and found with concealed weapon, is that concealed weapon handled differently than the run-of-the-mill firearm um, issues um, and disposition? I believe that seized concealed weapons under Oregon law have to be handled differently than other firearms coming into possession of the sheriff's office. In the case of uh, uh, stolen weapons, they're always returned to the owner if the owner can be identified. But under Oregon law, seized weapons have to be treated differently. And so this is segregating them out just to make sure that we comply with all those steps that are required in the law. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chang. And thank you, Captain Doyle. Any further questions before I ask for the motion? Uh, seeing none, uh, we have before us order 1707-1807. Do I have a motion? Commissioner Bozovich. So I'll move approval of order 1707-1807 in the matter of amending Lane Manual Chapter 60 to revise provisions pertaining to disposal of unclaimed personal property and county-owned surplus property. Second. Moved by Commissioner Bozovich, seconded by Commissioner Lykin. Discussion to the motion. It's kind of funny to think about uh, canines as surplus property, isn't it? Because we know that uh, they're not property. They actually own us, right? Is that correct, Commissioner Bozovich? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, and I will say I, I really appreciate this particular item because uh, I, one of my brother-in-law is a Dover city policeman and was their canine officer when his animal was retired he was allowed to, to keep possession of that animal and when he first married my sister-in-law um, he had that animal and and neat animal but it's definitely a very specialized animal and keeping ownership with the handler was really probably the correct way to, to deal with that animal so I, I think this is really an important provision you know besides the bond he had with that animal it's also not a normal animal to handle, you know, one that's been trained in the way a police uh, animal has been trained um, needs a special handler. So we Thank you. And I, I think it's safe to say that a bond does exist between the handler and the handled. Yes, it absolutely. Whichever one is the handler and whichever one is the handled. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Then we have a motion. Dis further discussion to the motion? I see none. I'll call for the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Ms. Smoker Heisky will take a step back to county administration announcements. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a couple things. First, I want to thank the commissioners who were able to participate last week in our recruitment process for Health and Human Services Director. Obviously, that's a significant uh, issue that we're dealing with, and um, we did a national search, had over I believe over 100 applications were reviewed and screened, and um, uh, I, along with Jocelyn Warren, uh, had phone conversations with about seven individuals and invited six uh, to participate in the final interviews last week. It included a meet and greet where we invited uh, Health and Human Service employees, community stakeholders, advisory committee representatives, uh, commissioners, uh, and members, uh, other community uh, partners and members of the public. Uh, we had two different panels, division manager panel, a peer panel of directors and elected department heads. Um, and uh, I met individually with each of the six on Friday of last week, and then we had a tour of various health and human service operations for those individuals. So we're continuing the process this week to review that. I've got a stack of comments that's about this big that I'm in the process of reviewing, and I'll read all of those comments because it's really important that as we ask people to participate and meet with uh, these candidates and provide feedback, it's really important that we incorporate that feedback into our decision process. So we had great, uh, I think, great participation uh, from folks. We had outstanding candidates. Uh, who are strong both on the public health side as well as on the human service side. So a tough decision in front of us, and my hope is that within the course of the next week that uh, we will finalize a decision and communicate that to, um, to you all and to the uh, organization and the community. So again, I want to thank you all for your participation and interest uh, in that. Secondly, uh, there's been we've had public comment, and we had it today on uh, request of the board to authorize overnight camping uh, at churches and other 
locations in the urban transition area. Um, we have met, our county staff has met on that topic. We have a meeting scheduled for next week where we're meeting with the city of Eugene staff um, on that. And so we're looking both at the regulatory requirements and framework that will be needed to make, to allow that as well as the entity that is going to be responsible and has the greatest capacity to manage that effort. Uh, even though I don't think the request is looking at uh, city or county owned land in the urban transition area, it's looking at privately owned property. We're still gonna need one of our governments to manage that, um, the, that program as the city of Eugene does within the city boundaries. They not only run the rest stop programs that are mostly on um, I should say, actually, are any of them on city-owned property? Most of them are on private property, mm -hmm. now that I think about it. Whether we had one on county-owned property mm -hmm. at one stage. There are some overnight camping um, uh, that is allowed and churches and other places. But the city of Eugene, I believe through their neighborhood services uh, office in the, county, or in the city manager's office, uh, manages that program. So that's the other side of the equation here is, is as we continue to work through resolving the regulatory requirements and framework, we also need to look at what governmental entity is actually going to enforce that regulation. Lane County is really not set up to do that. And so I think we're, we're struggling a little bit with, with you know, our capacity to manage that program. And so we're gonna be meeting with the city of Eugene staff next week to talk about the potential of, of um, the city's role in that effort. So I wanna share that with you because we continue to receive comments. I want you to know that we're actively working on it. Uh, Lydia McKinney, our land management division manager responded today to a couple of the uh, residents who've been coming and speaking under public comment to let them know that we have this meeting scheduled and we hope to um, uh, begin looking at some options and we will ultimately bring that back to the board. We do have some items scheduled on August 1st to talk about a supportive housing projects uh, on Lane County property and in particular at the behavioral health site. We're not planning to talk specifically about this issue on August 1st, but we will look at a, a future date to do that. Finally, I just wanna say it's uh, county fair time. So um, I believe tomorrow kicks off uh, Lane County fair and so, I'm going to try to drop by. I know that uh, my kids are anxious and excited to go to the Lane County Fair. And yeah, I, my daughter was telling me this morning something about a vegetable. Uh, you, tomorrow is uh, you can get into the fair. So I should have checked this before I made this comment. But and as opposed to asking Corey Buller, I asked my daughter, well, how do you get into the fair? Uh, so, uh, so great activity at the County Fair um, and encourage folks to uh, stop on by. Last year we had a fantastic fair, uh, great participation, revenue is really strong and we're anticipating the same with great great weather uh, this year. So the staff has done a really nice job of trying to land uh, uh, you know, the timing that works um, to maximize a uh, successful fair each year and it seems like we've hit the sweet spot there. So that's all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Morgaiski. And uh, Commissioner Williams, our fair board member, will be giving us a report during and after the fair, I hope. Planning on it. Any response to Commissioner, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, to Mr. Morkarajski's uh, comments? Uh, seeing none, we'll move along to uh, the Commissioner's business uh, announcements. I see no announcements. I'll make a single that one that I have. Uh, I'll be leaving on uh, Thursday of next week to attend the National Association of Counties annual conference in Columbus, Ohio. And I was wondering why they would pick Columbus, Ohio in the summer for a con conference. And I found out nobody else wanted it, so it was very, very cheap. So we're going to be there. <laughs> Columbus is a great town, but I hear it's not a particularly hospitable place in the summer. <laughs> Ms. Mokraski, you're from the Midwest. Maybe you know. I rather prefer Lane County. <laughs> <laughs> yep. yeah, Thank but... you. And uh, I'll be attending, um, I'll be, uh, attending the Human Services uh, committee meetings, health committee meetings, veterans affairs committee meetings, and a number of other meetings that will be uh, taking place during the uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday timeframe. So, uh, no further announcements. Uh, we have no reason for executive session today. So after recess, uh, we'll be re reconvening at 
1.30 p.m. in Harris Hall and begin with public works at 1.30 p.m. We're in recess. Great.